it's not really necessary to make a good game, right? But if you have unlimited resources, you can do that. And you see that in uh, like AAA titles, when they actually get details right, it's because they did the research and they did a bunch of stuff um, in the right way, technically. Uh, so that would be my take, at least. Like if we can spend money on really good reference, um, good equipment, pretty much anything that just helps development. And of course, growing the studio wouldn't be bad. Like the more people you have, you could technically just make the game faster, right? So yeah. So just out of curiosity, um, what was your, how did you get into animation? Um, it was uh, great talking to some of the other people, uh, like the head of uh, 3D modeling, who had a lot of professional credits, including Call of Duty. Uh, what has been your animation journey? Yeah, honestly, for me, it was a necessity. Like, I started out doing uh, the ISMC mod for Insurgency Sandstorm. And before that, I didn't have any experience, uh, you know, doing this kind of stuff at all. Um, so it started there, where I met Samir and some of the other guys, where... Uh, Samir already knew how to do really good modeling and texturing and he taught me a bunch of stuff. I got into doing textures first for like two years or so, um, mostly guns. And then we didn't really have an animator um, when we worked on ISMC and we didn't really know how to animate or get the animations in or anything really. So honestly there we just didn't have any sort of um, way of learning it. And then over time, I met people in um, different studios, in different places that we worked that uh, taught me. Like just, okay, this is how you set up uh, your basic gun animation. This is how you rig a gun, like going through like all of the technical stuff of how to set up bones, weight paint, understand again the pivot points, what that does to your animation. Uh, and yeah, it's, Probably not that long since I started. I think it's maybe one and a half years since I did my first animation, which was very basic, very... <laughs> it didn't look particularly good, but it was very fun to try. Um, and yeah, so it's been like one and a half years of just looking at other games, mm -hmm. asking other people. Um, like lately, I actually talked to Hyper and Mr. Brightside. Those are some <laughs> huge names in the uh, animator circles. And, uh, you know, they're awesome guys and they gave me some tips and it's just like learning more about the craft really it's all about just sitting there what we're doing now just posting out stuff trying to make it look realistic um and learning new things and be curious about how you can do stuff better we have another question uh i think we'll also probably have to be ambiguous on this one uh will there be any other game modes coming out not any spoilers like detailed descriptions just a yes or no question uh <laughs> will be your best response to that <laughs> Uh, I don't know, really. Um, I know that the game modes that we have, they would be fleshed out. Uh, they're really good as they are, but it would be nice to just continue to, you know, expand on all of them. I like PvP, for example. That's something that we play internally in the studio, uh, which is really, really fun. And so you're a great example. Like, uh, animation seems so difficult. Uh, what was your sort of starting point? Because th that's amazing that, you know, you're doing this kind of level of work and you've only been doing it for two years. Oh, uh, I, I don't know if you heard me. Um, uh, your, your path has been amazing that you're at this level and you've only been doing this for two years. I guess for uh, all the aspiring people here uh, who want to get into gaming professionally, what do you think is the best starting point to like learn 3D animation? Just because like wh when I see what you're doing here, it seems just so overwhelming to like, you know, being keyframes for each individual finger and uh, whatnot. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It's I, I think it's best to just start off doing uh, modding, like what we did, me and Samir. We, uh, we basically met at the time where it was all about just curiosity. We didn't get paid. It was no real, like, you know, benefit apart from the learning. Um, and there are some great tools out there. Like you can go on YouTube and you can search like, okay, I want to learn to model. Uh, and then you start off like, okay, do you want to model in uh, Blender? Do you want to work on, uh, you know, specific programs? 
and then you can really get into a lot of those technical things and it just starts from what exactly is it that you want to achieve like do you want to do what we did which was like uh, i want to make this plate carrier that's in the game green instead of black or i want to change the skin of this gun because i want to see if i can do that you know like i don't know what to do uh, technically but i want that to happen and then i think our first like <laughs> half a year or something doing the uh, the smc mod was just let's see if we can just change a texture like we just go into photoshop and we make it like yellow and see if that works and then it grows you know like you get better at those uh, programs this is again the program we're using here is blender so it's not only for animation but it's also for modeling i guess you technically could texture in here you can do renders um you can do a lot of things there and if you learn one thing you just get more experience to you know like just expand on what you want to do and it's really fun like it's just at some point you get a really rewarding uh, feeling like you just make something very simple something doable and then you get it into whatever engine or <laughs> game or whatever you're working on and you see it in context and you play with it and it's just the best feeling and that's kind of my main motivation at least where it's just if you learn a very simple thing and then you get some really good like uh, sense of accomplishment from that you'll just go on and do that all the time and again when i did mods that was like you know 16 hours a day or something just sitting there and learning and that's how you get good but you have to have some sort of motivation to do that you can't just say that i'm gonna sit there for 16 hours and animate because you would go crazy and you would be bored and it wouldn't be fun um so yeah it's like find your motivation basically is my uh, best uh, thing and then the rest will come from there fantastic all right so we are now live on youtube i was uh <laughs> futzing around uh so if you have any comments on youtube please uh give questions but bill microsoft in the uh discord asks what's your opinion on 3ds max oh uh, well honestly i've never done anything but blender so I wouldn't know. Um, I hear it's good. Um, the reason we use Blender here, at least, is because um, for the longest time it wasn't like the industry standard or whatever. It was just like a program uh, amateurs uh, and like people doing mods and stuff used. Uh, but now it's become good enough and it's free, mind you. Like that's the thing about Blender versus 3ds Max or uh, Maya or uh, those programs. It's just like you can. <laughs> you can just get it. You can go right now and you can get Blender for free and you can start working and that's it. Um, so that's a good uh, argument for that. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, if I had to use 3ds Max, I guess I'll try to do the same thing as I'm doing here, just learning the tools in a different way and then try to, uh, you know, get good enough so I can actually just make uh, what, what I have in my head, basically. Like if you're stuck with a program and you're annoyed with like the user interface or whatever um yeah it, it's not gonna work for you. you just have to get to a point where you can just do what i'm doing right now just messing with fingers right just get that to work and that's it so this may not necessarily be your area of expertise but mr duxy on youtube asks what about environmental art i've done some um it's very fun especially because i'm like I said, I came from doing textures, so I I don't know anything about modeling. Like, it's very strange, but I never learned that part of the process. Um, but I did a bunch of uh, texture work on guns, and then uh, it's more or less doing the same thing in environment. You just look at uh, whatever reference uh, you find. You go a little bit insane because you end up going around taking pictures of dumpsters and boxes on the street. And like, uh, you know, if you find an arrested tractor or something in your backyard or like an old car or something, you end up taking pictures because that's the kind of work that you typically do. Um, but yeah, you follow reference and you learn the tools. Um, again, the live stream we had with Dean was all about that stuff. Um, just looking at what you want to make. Let's say that we want to make this texture for the gun. You start looking for stuff like, okay, it's uh, not that shiny, it's bluish black, and it's uh, kind of metallic, you know? And that's sort of where you start, and then you start looking for details, and you try to do that. Um, and you have a bunch of techniques, 
much like animation and if you're really really good at it uh that's pretty much the um, the process like you look at what you want to make and <laughs> well you make it that's it sounds a little strange to say it that way but it's basically learning the tools again because you get motivated and once you get to a certain point it's all about just trying to make what you see in your head and learning more so you can get even closer to that basically there we go i think that's pretty much good enough for the hand for now we have a little bit of clipping with the the glove but that's usually not a big problem so there. typically how long would you say it takes like average on average for like the typical reload animation um about four hours it, it really depends uh if you have a good rig and you're working fast um and and well you don't have any problems like a lot of this work is like you work and then you get stuck because some problem with the rig or some problem yada yada and if you don't have any problems yeah sure like four hours maybe um and you also have to have all of the planning done beforehand at that point like if you decide now that well okay i don't want to make it this way i want to do something else then i'll basically start from you know the beginning again oh i forgot to name my file that's not good reload empty gun there we go so what do you think is like the for any aspiring animators here what's the hardware that you'd recommend would be like like what's the like if you want to get into this with this you know not spending uh, as much you know uh much money as possible what would you recommend I mean, you can do it with any laptop. It just depends on uh, the mesh that you have in the viewport here, because uh, I'm running something like a 3080 Ti and i9, I think. And that's great. Like, that works. But then I also have a laptop that's not as good, and that really starts lagging uh, if I try to run this rig uh, directly. And yeah, at that point, you just set up something called uh, like decimation, for example. Um, which is just making the mesh look worse by uh, on purpose, basically, just to make it run. Um, and then once I run the animation here, I want to see that I'm at least running on frames around 30, right? And if it goes into the red zone and runs at like 25 or less, um, we're going to have a problem because at that point you're getting uh, fooled by the frame rate. The frame rate is basically how fast the animation plays. And you want to have it pretty darn close to, uh, you know, the end result, because otherwise you're going to animate something that looks too fast or too slow. Um, and it's just not going to work for you. And you're going to get frustrated with the process rather than, uh, you know, having something that makes uh, sense from the start. So, yeah, get like decent PC, like it doesn't need to be amazing, but it needs to be good enough to run uh, Blender and run with a decent rig. And finally, you also just need to learn Blender. It's more about just learning the tools rather than spending a lot of money, I think. And when you were just starting out, how long would you, would you say it was like, um, how much practice did it take before you, you felt proficient with Blender? Oh, <laughs> I mean, I still don't feel proficient with Blender. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really about getting... I think it took like half a year maybe to get decent results, but uh, before those like even decent animations, um, I felt it was great. And then I took some time off maybe for a couple of days and came back to it and I felt that the animation looked terrible. And then I did another one that looked awesome, came back, it looked terrible. And it just kept on going that way and it still does, where I see some animations in the game right now where it's like, yeah, I mean, it's fine. I, I see a lot of stuff I could improve. I see, you know, things that I didn't do as well in the actual file, like not just talking about the animation itself, but just the way things were set up in the uh, in Blender, the way that I did constraints on the hands and the magazines that didn't make sense, uh, pivot points that were in the wrong place, basically. So if it's too far forward, like I said, the animation can be done a hundred times and it's still not going to feel the way that I want and so on. So it's like, yeah, you don't really get proficient to like a master level unless you spend probably like 10 years or something. Um, but you get good enough at the stuff that you do. And then you also get kind of good at seeing um, how you can fix problems, if that makes sense. Like you go in and you see 
uh, that there's something to do with the mesh that is the problem and you learn a lot of things from experience that has to do with that and then you get really good at fixing that and that's kind of where me and samir for example work together that if he has a problem with the mesh mm -hmm. i wouldn't know the first thing about fixing it but if it's a texture thing well i have quite a decent bit of experience doing gun uh, gun textures at this point so yeah I, I would certainly be able to kind of give my two cents on whatever problem he is having so that's kind of the thing that you get really good at one specific thing where is samir uh he was in here a minute ago right <laughs> he's always there I'll just assume he's he's back in the compound bunker, but I hope he pops in and uh, again. Uh, another fun no, question. No, he's there. Oh, he's there. Uh, uh, Samir, uh, yeah. uh, uh, speak. Uh, I, I want to hear more about your guys' friendship and how you bonded and uh, uh, yeah. your animation journey. Am I the only one here, Samir? But thank you, for everyone, for turning out. This is a wonderful turnout. I'm so amazingly pleased. Uh, <laughs> it feels like some of the processes uh, implemented in the last week are uh, finally getting the kind of Discord engagement I've been looking for. But yes, uh, we have uh, talks about uh, the juicy bonding st bonding stories. Uh, what is your origin story with how you met Samir? How did you become best animation buddies working for this intrepid project? <laughs> well, um, actually, I started off just uh, making like... Um, well, actually, let's go all the way back. We started off doing like mods uh, first, like I said. Um, and it started with... Uh, basically, Samir being my like teacher, uh, along with a couple of other guys. Uh, Dean was one of them. Uh, Tempter is also here. Just those guys taught me so much uh, by just doing stuff in the mod. And we talked about how we could improve. You know, like, okay, we want to make guns. Okay, that's cool. Um, how do we make nice looking guns? And then we started working on different things like, um, you know, Operation Hard Store stuff. We were working there for some time. Learned a bunch of stuff there. Uh, we figured out a bunch of stuff with, uh, I think we worked on Ground Branch after that, uh, a little bit with our uh, AK Productions uh, team, which is me and Samir just doing uh, freelance work, doing uh, guns, uh, models, and textures. Um, and now we're working on Beautiful Light, which is also uh, like a tactical shooter project. It's more like a loot, what's it called? Like loot and shoot? No. <laughs> Extraction shooter, that's the name, yes. Um, so yeah, basically just uh, we started off doing what we liked together. Uh, Samir taught me a bunch of stuff. Eventually I started learning and we did stuff together. And uh, yeah, Tempter is in there as well, I see in the chat. Um, and yeah, still we're doing the same thing where we're just figuring stuff out. We're going through uh, you know, the stuff that we did back in the day, looking at that, what we could have done better. We look at, uh, of course, other people's work. Um, Again, I can't recommend enough to go and check out, for example, uh, on YouTube, there's a bunch of like texture tutorials. Um, Stefan Engdahl, I believe, was one of the guys that like released actual texture sets from the stuff. At the... <laughs> like he made guns for, I think it was Hell Let Loose. And then they literally gave, I think it was free. Like he gave out like all of the texture packs from those guns, like wood and metals and stuff. And just like, here, take it, learn from it. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much like just taking stuff that you are interested in, try to learn from it, see how it ticks, uh, break it into sections, uh, spend some time just really dissecting what you want to learn. I, I think it's the best uh, explanation there. But I'll leave it to Samir here if we can hear him. I, I can hear him for some reason, so <laughs> I hope that everyone else can hear him as well. Uh, yeah. I have not heard him yet, uh, but I, I look forward to. Uh, another... Really? No, he's right there. <laughs> uh, he's ghost, Samir, but... <laughs> uh, do you have your push to talk on? That might be an issue where, um, like, you know, in this channel is set to push to talk. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, I can hear you, but try push to talk as well. Uh, so in the meantime, though, oh, no. which anime? Another question from Bill Microsoft. <laughs> which animation is your favorite and least favorite in 5K? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I think the AK is my least favorite right now, and that's the reason why I'm still like tweaking it. Um, I have no idea why. I, I just couldn't get 
it to feel the way I wanted, and it just annoys the crap out of me. Um, and it's like I, I even bought like Nearsoft AK uh, because we don't really have much AKs in Norway where I'm from. Uh, we mostly have AR-15s and AR-9s and uh, Glocks and whatever. Um, but yeah, basically, just I wanted to really understand the AK uh, and how it operates and how it's supposed to move. And this is actually a really good what we're working on here. This is a really good example of basically the same thing. Like right now, I'm just gravitating towards that kind of mag flick that I did for the AK. Um, and yeah, if I make this better, then I might just go back to the other AK and just uh, yeah, well, try to make it better. Uh, it's the best term, and it's coming. Yeah, it's. Exactly, exactly, yeah, and and you come down to, uh, you know, like the small things, like okay, so once we're getting to the final pass on this, it's gonna be something like the gun moves, the magazine moves, uh, the camera moves, and you have all of those elements together, and you try to figure out, like for example, in Modern Warfare or in Insurgency Sandstorm or in Ready or Not, like how do they mix those elements together to get their style? And then you try to mix that into our style. And it's like a weird hybrid. Um, uh, I think Mr. Brightside said something like, it looks like his style combined with hypers. And it's sort of like in between. Uh, we had a discussion about that where it, it's basically like just looking at what you like and you end up making it. And it's just, yeah, it sort of blends into each other. And the reason why, you know, people make Modern Warfare looking animations these days because, well, it looks nice. It's certainly a new take on it. Like it's very close to reality it's certainly very close to the reference i film uh when i do my practice shooting in real life and it's just it feels grounded and it feels nice so we try to make very like dissected um uh, decisions on uh, like what what makes that animation tick we could actually just look at that for a brief moment here if people are interested in uh, of course just, this is all about uh, getting uh, into yeah, the weeds animation. yeah uh so that would probably be like yeah, Modern Warfare 19, maybe uh, 22 animations. Yeah, there we go. Just to see something that uh, doesn't need to be on a specific uh, set, of course. Let's see here. Yeah, so there's a bunch of stuff to uh, desiccate here. Uh, this is what me and Samir typically sit and do as well, where we just, I do an animation and he sends me like a video of some other animation and says, well, couldn't we do like this? Like something with the camera something with how the hands move all of the small jitters uh and just all of the small details that basically make this animation look the way it does um so of course the first thing that we're seeing here is that it's very fast and fast is good because typically when i do animations in the game they're maybe half the speed of what i can do in real life which is like and I'm not really that good either. Like people that really know how to handle AKs can do really fast reloads. Um, you know, like sub-second reloads um, in some cases. And <laughs> that's just the way it is. And when people say that Modern Warfare is fast, well, yeah, but it's also kind of closer to that style. So that's the first thing. Uh, then we're seeing that, okay, since it's fast, it's going to move uh, kind of like snappy and very like jittery, like all of the small jitters and shakes we see on the actual gun. Um, and it's also at the same time, not very floaty at all. It just sits more or less where it sits, like it's just there. <laughs> and it doesn't really move around. If we're looking in a moment, uh, we can go over to look at uh, Insurgency Sandstorm, for example, where it just moves, you know, in waves and it's really artistic and exaggerated uh, and slow. Uh, this is more like just, okay, it moves exactly the amount it needs and not much more. For example, there, when we go back in slow motion, we can see that it's like turning around and in a moment here, it's going to dip down in the reverse, of course, since we're looking at it backwards. And the reason why it dips down is because, of course, he's like throwing the gun up a bit and then it comes down. Uh, it has what we call in the animation uh, department or <laughs> the five principles of animation, I think it's called, uh, like the travel through or follow through. Uh, so that just means that, okay, some physical interaction happens, so you want to move past the point and then back up again. Uh, so basically, yeah, that's the way that we would analyze the movement here. And then the final thing would be to actually look beyond the gun and just look at how the camera moves. And the way you do that is by looking at, well, the background. And you can see that sometimes it just moves. It moves kind of quick. It's not really floaty or anything. It just looks in different direction and stays there. 
and then on certain actions like very hard like mag in mag out bolt pull whatever it's really like shaking and just thrown all over the place um and that's like a trademark modern warfare animation thing at this point where you don't really see that <laughs> happening in other games um modern warfare no uh, battlefield 2042 no is it 2042 yeah yeah that game it's like they tr tried to do that kind of thing but they did it on the gun instead of on the head in some weird way it's like all of this kind of stuff is i think all of the animators out there are trying to do more or less the same thing by analyzing like trying to figure out what this is um you know what is the head movement what is the gun movement what looks good what doesn't look good yeah exactly the secret sauce and that's the thing that we're trying to kind of get to the bottom of where if by any chance I get really good at this, uh, you know, in a couple of years, like to the point where I actually understand why it's good, uh, I would be able to put that into, you know, tutorials and make a more, uh, let's call it more like a, an academic way of looking at this, right? Like we could actually dissect why modern warfare looks the way it does. And we could talk about why it looks different from Insurgency Sandstorm and so on, right? Like you just, really get into the nerdy details but at the same time you get into something that is basically lacking from the industry right now which is uh, a consensus of why the animation in first person is done the way it is it's a whole thing like i'm not gonna go into why <laughs> uh why it's so big uh, such a big difference between first person like gun animations and general like animation because that's just too much uh but it's a big difference and it's just very annoying because there is very little to go on when you want to learn this stuff apart from obviously looking at games which is not really uh, you know it, it's not really academic at that point it's just like yeah you just do it which is <laughs> not the best um you know uh trick to give someone when you're starting out um all right, perfect. Uh, so another question we have is, uh, what gun would you want in the game uh, that isn't in the game if you could have any gun? Uh, you know, unlimited resources. Hmm. I mean, uh, for me, it's probably... Yeah, it's a complicated one because me and Samir have... Like, we're very, very into the modern guns. <laughs> so, of course, I would like to have the MCX family at some point. Just go through the whole Spear family and all of the calibers. Um, and, yeah, probably some more... I don't know. Like, we have talked about different calibers and different things. But it would be very similar in terms of gameplay. So, yeah, maybe it would be nice to, to get more into the DMR stuff. Something that would be you know, making a big change to the gameplay. Um, a proper, like, LMG uh, that is not the CAC, you know, the LAMG, because that's more like an assault kind of shot from the shoulder kind of gun. Uh, yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a tricky one, but I guess I would like to see something modern and also something that would change the gameplay a little bit. So, yeah. Another, uh, my apology for everyone if your question is not uh, being answered so quickly. I like to not step over Anders, especially when he's on a roll. Um, but keep, keep him coming. I, I do like it. Um, which one is Samir's profile? Maybe I accidentally muted him. I hope I didn't uh, by accident. Uh, what's his uh, profile name in the uh, Discord uh, uh, fray server? Yeah, it's Caden. Uh, and it's also the black and white AK uh, picture there. So it's like a circle with an AK in the middle. My apologies, Samir, that I I feel so stupid. Oh, was I muted the whole time? No worries. Uh, my <laughs> apologies. I thought you were a rogue person because, um, you know, it didn't have the thing. Uh, so we've had both of you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Samir, uh, you are the Jedi Master to Anders. Um, talk about your mentoring process of uh, becoming a master and student in the 3D arts. Hmm. I'd say, how can I answer this? I'd say this is something that you will have to learn by yourself purely, because as as Anders animates, I do 3D modeling. It's a job that is initially passion. So 
if if you want to get to to the level we are at and you have the certain drive behind it the certain inspiration because personally that, that was that came from escape from tarkov i don't think i would be in the 3d modeling space if that game didn't exist just because of how precise they were into you know whatever they were doing modeling wise and texturing wise So you just you just, you just gotta go. Uh, like Andre said, we we met through Insurgency Sandstorm when we were working on uh, on a common project, and it just all started from there. We were learning together as well with uh, Tempter, Wolf, everyone else, Warrior J, so many people, and uh, this is where we are at now. Fascinating. And again, my apologies for muting you by accident. I feel so horrible. <laughs> I, no I denied all these people such wonderful conversation. Uh, we have another great question. Would uh, swapping uppers for some guns, M4, MCX, etc., to change barrels and calibers, or, sim uh, uh, or simply aesthetics be plans uh, for the future? I mean, we can't really go into details, of course, um, in terms of what we're planning, but uh, just for me and Samir's personal, you know, just <laughs> what we'd like. Yeah, of course. Why not? <laughs> uh, um, like I said earlier as well, we're making um, certain, like, uh, we're not necessarily limited by the game in, in terms of, like, um, making actual uppers and change textures and stuff, but it's more about being clever uh, so the gun, uh, so the game runs well, right? Like, let's call it that. Um, so if you have, for example, the upper for this one and you want to be very precise, well, obviously it says 556 five, and then you would have a separate texture saying 762 by 39 and you would remove uh, the bolt release and you would do all of this. So it's like in that kind of category of, yes, it would be very cool, but at the same time, it would just be bloating the size of the game to probably three times the size for no particular reason. Looking at Arma 3 mods, for example, when you start downloading mods, Yes, you get like a hundred uniforms, but you're also getting five hundred gigabyte game. Um, so yeah, it's it's in that kind of vein where yeah, sure, but we probably need to do it in a very clever way to kind of get you know a good compromise going. So another question yeah, I keep it's... on getting. Oh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, another question I keep on uh, want to address is uh, from Nova. What is the current plan for Operation Moonfall? Operation Moonfall. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I couldn't answer that. Uh, <laughs> so Moonfall is to be determined uh, by the O5 Council. <laughs> but uh, yeah, sorry yes. for interrupting your uh, <laughs> thought. Uh, you know, uh, pick up where you last left off. Yeah, I was going to say, for, uh, continuing upon what Anders was saying, for games you kind of have to take sacrifices. So, for example, this gun is pretty much a hybrid. This is this has started and been modeled as a SG553 base, and we transform it into an SG553R by just adding a 762 by 39 mag, which is what he's animating with right now. Stuff like that. You can't you can't make a whole new gun. You just have to switch one part. It stays the same gun, but it's a new one technically. Same as for the. Smith & Wesson Model 500. We have different barrel lengths, but it's essentially the same gun. Another question we have. Did you guys have to purchase licenses from firearm makers? A copyright license? Um... No, but we do have people working specifically on that. And there are multiple ways of doing that by like, you can talk to the license people themselves, mm -hmm. like directly to the, the manufacturer. Um, so yeah, there, there's a bunch of ways people are getting by that. And there was also a very interesting um, video from, I think it was GameSpot who did like a, a thing on that where they talked about why AAA versus indie, uh, you know, it's, it's a very different thing uh, because when you get into it, it's all about money, of course, and it depends on the manufacturer. It depends on uh, a lot of things, really. But it's it's mostly coming down to just having a good relationship with uh, the manufacturer. But at the same time, obviously, we don't want to get very political in a video game. So if you, for example, have a lot of 
uh, very specific markings and you're obviously like endorsed, I guess, by a brand, that's not good either. So it's like a very strange kind of re relationship thing there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to describe in just a few sentences, but it's also getting handled. So it's not like we're in any danger of getting sued or anything, but it's certainly, uh, it's tricky. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people are, it's like a full-time job that people are doing just working with that. And we have another question from YouTube. Um, this person has been waiting very uh, patiently. Um, Lucius A asks, how do you connect weapon animation to leg and body in the game? So that is actually done very cleverly by, um, it starts at the shoulder, like everything you see on my screen right now. Um, that is actually set up in such a way that um, the character is using motion capture stuff and all of the stuff that's separately made and still being worked on, uh, mind you. Uh, so that's like a whole thing that we're working on. And then basically setting up the arms is, it's pretty much done as you see it here. Like you just attach it, but at the same time, you have to be very uh, mindful of what kind of angle the, uh, the shoulders are in. Uh, one thing that comes to mind, at least for the pistols, for example, is that uh, most people, when they shoot pistols, including myself, you would have your shoulders in line. Uh, while when you shoot a rifle, they're more in an angle like this. And in our game right now, and most other games, to be honest, like Modern Warfare, whether or not, I believe, has the problem, is that you get kind of awkward looking pistol pose because it's like they're standing in sort of an, a weird angle and they're not holding the pistol straight out. And it's like, ugh, not very nice. Uh, so, yeah, we're working on like ways of solving that. But it's certainly very nice to have basically all of the stuff I'm making here be almost exactly replicated in third person. Like it's just attached and then we're trying to do some smart stuff to get those magazines uh, disappearing at the right time still working on that um and so on so it's like everything is uh, coming together uh, by just attaching it and then try to make it look nice and what would you say was the most challenging animation you've had to work on so far in the game oh um I mean, every time I do something new, it's challenging, I think. So, for example, the two other revolvers was actually not done by me. Um, I did tweaks here and there, but it's uh, done by uh, Groovecat and El Barney, uh, which is uh, one of the animators that worked with us uh, for the longest time. And El Barney is, well, obviously our CEO or, uh, like, hi, a person and is also doing animations or did more in the past. Uh, so yeah, just having the Smith & Wesson 500 be basically just going in, trying to figure out how does this work in the game? And it was all technical. This bullet needs to exist and then it doesn't exist and then it comes back and then it's replaced by a different mesh and it's just, yeah, very technical, not very fun, particularly necessarily just doing animation, like the fun part. Um, but yeah, it's, it's challenging to get to know a new gun, especially if you don't handle it yourself. Um, and I mean, this one, uh, it's, it's sort of similar to the AK. So yeah, we'll see how this goes. And maybe that's going to be the most challenging one. I don't know. So we have a question from Lear. Uh, do you go to fire these guns yourself to get a better perspective? Or do you just watch videos of people using the guns and reloading them? Yes, I do. So I do a lot of competition shooting. Um, I shoot mostly PCC and pistol, uh, a little bit of rifle when I can. Um, but yeah, like uh, any gun I can ha get my hands on. I own a P320 myself, um, I get to shoot a lot of Glocks, uh, Volthers, different pistols. And then we're also trying to kind of mix that together with uh, the collective kind of uh, gun understanding we have in the team like people have either done airsoft or have guns for hunting or like any sort of experience that we have within the team we start those discussions on uh, you know the baseline of just what is it that, that we're actually trying to make here for example for this one it's like yeah it's like an ak understanding the gun mechanics of the bolt release and whatnot um and then actually shooting something like an ak um I have shot like an AKM once, so it's not something I'm particularly 
you know, familiar with, but I own an Airsoft AK, which is fine. Uh, it sort of gets me the same kind of feeling for how the magazines insert and so on. Um, so yeah, it's uh, as much as I can. Yes, absolutely. And I do, uh, I do spend my hard hard earned money, you know, on ammo and uh, you know tax tax write offs, of course, to go to the range as much as I can. And it's a big part of the job, basically. Like if you're shooting a lot, you also understand quite a bit more about what this is all about. If you don't, it's like, yeah, but you may miss some crucial details when you watch a video, I think. So Drassel has an interesting question. I guess I would love to hear both of your perspectives. What is your top three favorite guns that you own and why? Should I start or Samir? Or... I can go ahead. Yeah. It'll be a quick answer. Because yeah. I own no guns. <laughs> so. Well, uh, I'll add an addendum. Uh, which are the top three favorite guns you either own or have fired or used? That too. I fired no weapons. <laughs> <laughs> yet. We are going to the U.S. Yeah, it's going to be very fun. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're planning a very nice uh, range trip in March, me and Samir. Uh, going because I'm not the... in the U.S., it's not so easy for me to get access to anything that is weapons related. So yeah. I guess the closest thing I have to a firearm would be an airsoft replica. I own an AK-105 and a Glock 17 Gen 5. Yeah, I agree with Samir. Like, I do get to shoot quite a bit, but it's mostly in, in the competition setting. It's more about um, not necessarily the fun factor of it. Like, you're getting really down to the, uh, like, you know, making your gun shoot as be good and fast as possible. And you kind of, uh, you know, kit it out with red dot sights and make it very heavy and so on. So yeah, from that perspective, it's I would certainly like to own way more guns just for the fun factor. Like, uh, why not get some machine guns? Uh, <laughs> it's certainly very difficult to do in Norway. Uh, it's possible. Uh, I looked into it. Yes, it is possible. But it's like it's very, very hard to get um, to that point where you can actually just own a bunch of guns and just go shoot them because we're making a video game. But that would be very, very cool. Um, and it also helps quite a bit to, again, like I said, if you learn how to use those firearms and just really get to handle that stuff, you're getting better at what you're doing, I think. Fantastic. That gives you a, oh. a, a, a thing that is more, that is a knowledge that is deeper than surface level. That's, that's what I think I would find very useful, especially when it comes to me telling you some stuff about animation you know how a weapon bounces back on your shoulder or how it recoils stuff like that exactly because a video isn't the same as trying it in real life of course yeah so do you uh did you animate some weird esoteric guns uh something like the gyro jet or hk uh one one or eight yeah hkg one one <laughs> yeah the g11 it's uh I haven't animated any of those yet. That would be very fun. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, mostly like the stuff in 5K um, mm -hmm. and just really basic guns, really. Uh, nothing fancy. The most fancy we have done is like, I don't know, a revolver or something. Like it's most of them are just magazine fed modern firearms. So yeah. <laughs> So we have another interesting question from Lear. Neat, do you have any plans on adding any sort of bolt-action rifle, a uh, CAR 97K? I know it wouldn't be too practical considering the environment of Area 12, but it would be pretty fun in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, uh, we do have the M24, uh, which is probably going to get a uh, revamp and new animations and so on like at some point. Um, but the problem with those rifles, as uh, Lear also mentions there, is that they're not very practical. And at the point where we get sniping or some sort of like reason to have that you know used like yeah absolutely but it all depends right like i, I don't know if there's any particular like let's say insurgent faction in the scp 5k lore where it's like applicable to get like a storm giver or a bolt action rifle or like it, it's cool but it's just yeah where would that fit in i think that's the main question that we have to ask as uh, developers rather than like, yeah, it's cool and we just want it. 
Another interesting question uh, from Nova. Uh, will spent magazines ever appear on the floor as props or spent bullets in some in the same way? Uh, I mean, that sounds really cool, but that sounds like super demanding uh, um, on the, uh, you know, most PC, uh, PCs. But uh, I'm sure you guys have a much more informed answer than I could give. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we already have uh, the casings. I remember we did a lot of work on the casings. We made like a whole library of uh, models, me and Smear. Yep. Um, and we also had a really good, um, uh, what do you call it? Like VFX. Uh, is that this where work is, Smear? When uh, charge, basically, oh, like right? Particle like particle effect? Yeah, particle effect. Yeah, there we go. So he came in and did a lot of work on that. Uh, so I think we already have uh, the mm -hmm. casings. And um for magazines, yes, absolutely. Like it's very annoying to work with these magazines and just invent where they're gonna land because when you turn the gun, then the magazine is gonna turn, and then yeah. So the ideal scenario would be that the moment it leaves, it becomes a physical object with some data on what last happened to it. Like for example, here it gets pushed by the magazine and it's turning, and it's like okay, yeah, let the game do its thing, and that would make it, uh, you know, fall into the world and become an asset. So. Yeah, I can't say yes or no, like we're going to do it, but it would certainly be very nice. And it is possible, like other games have done it. Just a matter of time and resources. Exactly. What we can allocate our priorities to. So you might have covered this already, uh, but um, it, it, Secret Agent Pancake asks... When did you get into gun uh, animation making? I, I assume, uh, yeah, because that is a very specific field to uh, get into, uh, specifically uh, in terms of uh, learning animation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's honestly, again, coming down to what is your interest? Like I uh, drawn guns since I was like four years old or whatever, like always drew pistols and stuff and tried to like invent new guns when I was in school and didn't pay attention in class, you know, just sitting there drawing. Um, and then I considered doing like an engineer kind of thing. Um, I was looking into like, okay, could I become a gun maker or like, what would I do with that kind of thing? And then for the longest time, I didn't do anything with it, just played games. And yeah, this was like turning out to be the perfect kind of, um, middle ground, I get to shoot guns uh, multiple times a week because I need it for research so I can write it off on the taxes. It's uh, a really rewarding experience to get to work with, um, you know, games in general. Um, and then the gun and the game kind of fascination uh, came together. But it's very specifically like you have to understand and like guns and the mechanics of it. And it's a, it's a very specific thing. It's like cars. I usually say, like, if you really like cars, you get it, right? Like, then you know how they're supposed to work and you know, you know, the small intricate details and the differences between cars. It's just, if you're really into that, that's just, you know, the way that you think about it. Uh, same with the guns. Like, if you don't care about guns, they're all going to look the same and it's just going to be like this, wow, okay, another gun. <laughs> What's so different about this one? But for me, it's like, wow, this one is great because it's Swiss and it has a history and it came from, you know, uh, a long history of like stamping technology that came from the Germans and it's so cool. And it's like, oh my God. And it becomes this whole, uh, you know, history buff kind of thing where you're really into what you're doing there. So this is kind of a it's funny question. Uh, <laughs> will you leak or make Half-Life 3? What? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, I don't know what people worked on that last. Maybe there are some people out there that's like working on something similar. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So here's We're a little bit more. Making of... Half-Life 4. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that's why the update's taking so long. A phrase actually working on Half-Life 4. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, there's an SCP that is basically an MP... Uh, mp5 that is alive and shoots human teeth instead of bullets uh if you can answer uh do you consider adding it as an easter egg or uh haven't thought about it at all or uh, would that be doable i mean that sounds fun <laughs> absolutely how long would it take that, that does not sound like an easy thing to create i mean we already have at kind of mp5 we have a, a zf5 i think it's called it's from zenith 
and you would make it shoot what is it say like teeth human yeah, teeth I mean, would change so i, I yeah, don't think it's, it's an actual very... mp5 it's like an organic body to it so uh, yeah. the modeling would be pretty interesting on that one yeah oh absolutely Oh, that would be actually really fun when I think about it, because it would, like you say, Samir, require you to to make something like uh, an organic kind of uh, morph target based thing, maybe like it yep. would move and yeah. Learning possibility for animation as well. Yeah. Question. Uh, I'm sure this might not be. Um, uh, Nova asks, "Will there be? Will you add Easter eggs to the game, like SCP six nine six nine? Maybe. Um, I guess. Uh, I, I don't know if you'd be able to answer that, but I guess. Are, are there any Easter eggs and animations that you like to put in? Um, yeah, I mean, it's always fun to try and get those in uh, if you have a really good idea of you know some sort of fun Easter egg. But uh, for the guns, it's been. I guess that's not really an Easter egg, right? But it's more about like, okay, how can we make this particular gun, you know, handle in a certain way? And when you do different inspects or whatnot, you want to make it not necessarily an Easter egg, but like if you're a gun nut and like really like guns and you pay attention to the stuff that we do and you see like small details that people otherwise wouldn't pay attention to, right? Like, for example, having this gun not activate the bolt release on these magazines but on the 556 magazine it's like okay that's it's not a funny easter egg but it's a very interesting one right like it's just yeah putting the kind of extra passion into something that no one except like two people will notice and care <laughs> about <laughs> so here's a personal question from me um who do you think is uh, does better gu uh, animations, uh, gun animations, um, Respawn or like all of the Call of Duty studios? Oh, good question. I mean, I'm very particular to the new, like uh, the Modern Warfare 19, uh, Modern Warfare 2 and, and 3, uh, just because of the, uh, like the interaction I had with that at the time, right? Like I started off doing this kind of stuff right after Modern Warfare 19 was starting to get, you know, the kind of praise it got. And I saw like the potential of what was possible to do in first person animation there. So it's really cool. Like it's uh, for me, at least like just very, uh, I don't know, like it, it's innovative in a way. Like, yeah, it hasn't been done in that way before. So yeah, for me, it's Call of Duty. <laughs> And do you think it's harder to animate um, real life weapons or uh, you know fantasy futuristic weapons? I think honestly, I never animated anything that's not uh, like realistic. Like that's the only thing I did since I started. So I think it would be very hard to do something made up. Like I would go away from uh, looking at reference and maybe try to uh, you know invent something like how to operate a certain gun. And yeah, it would be very interesting. Question: Will you make any reference to the entity It? Uh, I, if you're talking about the Stephen King It, I highly doubt it, um, since that's a Warner Brothers <laughs> entity. But uh, I don't know. Yeah. If, what do you think, Anders? Sounds like we're gonna get sued. <laughs> There's your answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, if any modders want to put Pennywise or It, uh, you know, as like a skin, uh, you know, have at it. Uh, knock yourselves out but uh, yeah i don't think that's gonna happen officially yeah that's also by the way the only way we can get glocks in the game uh guys like if you want glocks then you have to make uh, a mod and not tell anyone that you made the model and just not put your name on it and then you won't get sued maybe <laughs> it's very hard and also hk like if you want anything real hk marking wise it's just gonna be yeah Yeah, they they talked about that on on the 
what is it, GameStop? No. GameStop. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, basically that video where they were talking about on how on some guns the military variation was allowed, but not the civilian, because the military is something that is for the people. And that so might... the, in, in the legal aspect of things, it makes yeah. it authorized for you to use it on, you know, the games, for example. Exactly. So if you have the SCAR H, I think that's the Mark uh, 17. That, you know, stuff uh, like it's, that. It's uh, exactly what we did, right, Samir? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. For, uh, Fosh says, uh, I'm late here, but will custom animations be possible in any way? Custom animations as in making them yourself, or...? That's a good question. Uh, I, I guess, like, can you, will, like, you be able to add in, like, customized reloads or something? Um, you'd have to elaborate yeah. further, Mr. Fosh, but, um, uh, like, love to hear it. Uh, but I guess, uh, are you going to add something where players can customize their animations, potentially? I mean, yeah, absolutely. And, and we talked about having, uh, you know, the kind of, like okay so our setup in the game is made in such a way that it wouldn't really require uh, maybe more than six animations to to make a new gun um very specifically when you hold a gun in the start of animation um that is just one pose and we set it up in such a way that if anyone like we did when we made ismc wants to go in and just make let's say uh like an AK or like an SG-503, but not quite, you would be able to just change this pose um, and then have it blend into the animation. Um, so you just need to make it like, okay, it fits there. That's the new custom pose. And then it fits on the magazine. That's the only thing that you need to make sure. Um, and also in addition, of course, just having few animations in general means that you can go in and basically if you have enough knowledge about uh, how to make uh, what we're making here, like these files, and be able to export them and so on. Uh, yeah, for sure. You would just be, I guess, really just making the game with us at some point there. Like you would make the guns that we can't really add, like, again, HK guns, for example. I'd like a 417, but it's possible I might just need to make a mod myself. You know, like if I have the time at some point and say, hey, this is not official. This is, you know, just straight off the, uh, like, my personal uh, thing that I want to do. But here's uh, 417 with custom animations and custom sounds and whatnot. But it's certainly not official, right? Like, it's not official in the game because it's definitely not something we're going to get sued by or whatever. So it's like, yeah, that's the way to do it. All right, so we got an interesting question from Launch Space. Uh, one thing that I do for fun sometimes is write songs. And I was wondering, as an animator, is there an animator version of writer's block that can get in the way of your workflow? And if so, is there anything you can do to get out of that hole? Yeah, absolutely. I'm also a musician myself. Like, I spent, like, 12 years <laughs> uh, getting a master's degree and stuff in uh, music teaching. So, yeah, it's, it's the, definitely the same thing. I work in the same way when I write my uh, guitar riffs as I do uh, animation and you get stuck in the same way. Uh, which typically comes from, uh, I would say, like self-doubt. When you start thinking about it, it's very logical that if I say that this animation sucks and it can't get, you know, good, like this is not going to work. Everything I did here uh, up until this point looks like shit. I don't like it. Yeah, I, I'm going to get stuck, right? Like it's not going to be very fun to work on it and I'm just going to quit and I'm going to do something else, go play a game or something. Um, but uh, the same thing applies in both where... You just say, yeah, it's maybe it's not great yet. It certainly looks like something. <laughs> it's one of the animations of all time. Um, but it's like, yeah, at that point, try to be, you know, kind of nice to yourself and go through the whole thing that is, you know, typical to artists that is like, yeah, just, you know, trust that you know the process, trust that uh, what you're making is actually uh, pretty decent. It's, it's not, you know, this is not bad. Like, just trust it. And it will, in the end, turn out good because you're, you know, working on it until it's not shit anymore. So, yeah. Uh, all right. So here's a question. Um, will you add rocket launchers or flamethrowers? And I guess are those <laughs> di more difficult yeah. to animate than what you're working on now? I mean, it would be different to animate. Uh, probably not too difficult, right? Because we're talking, okay, let's say a flamethrower. Um, I guess you would have 
an animation for pulling the trigger and it doesn't really move, um, it would certainly be a lot of work for uh, whoever is going to make um, the particles, <laughs> I guess. Making the actual model is probably going to be more work than the animations. Um, but yeah, like it, it all depends on how intricate is it to make it move. I think that's like the the main thing when you're thinking about what is difficult to animate. Rocket launches as well, like, yeah, sure, it's it's a tube and it's a rocket that you put into the tube. Doesn't sound very difficult, but it's certainly going to be very difficult to animate the projectile flying in the right way and make it actually interact with the world, make it explode in a good way. You know, like, there's a lot of stuff goes into not only the animation part there. A recurring question I keep on getting. Uh, will Russian Roulette be a game mode? I don't think it will be, but I, I guess... Uh, <laughs> no. How would you animate that? I guess it could... Yeah, I guess you could play... Yeah, I don't know how you would play that, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you... It's the thing about the revolvers. If you press the shoot key when you're in double action mode, it doesn't actually shoot. It just, like, goes into this dry fire thing. Um, and that is intentional, uh, where you actually have to hold it for, like, 0.2 seconds or something. So yeah, you could do that if you just click, 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 and then hold and see how close to holding the button can you get without it firing. Sure, you can do that now. <laughs> Xdreeper asks the practical question that you may not be able to answer. How do I make a flamethrower? Well, you How learn. making a flamethrower? Yeah, you learn carefully. the different. Yeah, carefully, right? And, and you learn the programs that you need. Um, <laughs> like Samir said, you, if you really want to make a flamethrower, that's that's your answer. You're gonna do it. You're gonna be able to do it, and it's gonna be fantastic. I seen a really good flamethrower recently. I think um, there was in one of the the weapon room. I think it's called like one of the groups where they had like a competition or something, and it was so good. Like it looked for the realistic uh, Vietnam era flamethrower. So people do that. Like, you just need to really want to make a flamethrower, I guess. So I I'm kind of curious. How did you make the trans... What inspired you to transition from, like, getting a master's in music to going uh, to uh, <laughs> animation? It seems so wildly different. Yeah, it was COVID. Honestly, like yeah, during that time, uh, we didn't really get any jobs. Uh, I was just finishing my master's and I wanted to get, you know, a decent paying job as a music teacher. And of course, COVID happened and no one really, uh, you know, hired. And yeah, so I just took up like video games, sat down. I thought, hey, I, I kind of like doing this kind of stuff. Maybe I could, you know, learn. That's, that's it pretty much. Yeah. Uh, I didn't really plan to have a, a job in it either. And it's just been really lucky, really, that I'm able to actually make a living of doing only this um, and not rely on, for example, uh, you know, commission work uh, or working in film, for example. Like a lot of animators, I believe, have to do all of it, like just be really good in every department. But I have been able to, uh, been lucky enough to just work with most the guns um, and just like do one thing. Uh, really, yeah, again, just very lucky, very grateful to be able to do that. So here's uh, an interesting question. Will it be possible to use both flashlight and IR illuminator on rifles at once like real life? Or will it stay as uh, in-game for balance reasons? Would also be nice to add uh, t tape uh, switches that the character would use to activate accessories on their rifle. Yeah. No, actually both. I, I don't think I can talk much about it, honestly. But it's like, yeah, I, I do agree with both things. Um, and they'd make a lot of sense. And... I even had some ideas very specifically for how we could do, um, not necessarily tape, but we could do like uh, bits of strips um, attached to the mesh and you could have like um, a custom wire going on every gun. Like you just make a very simple wire and it would make it like a, a morph target, basically. Um, all of this is very technical, but it would certainly work in theory. Uh, and you would have a pad somewhere that would be close enough to be mostly applicable, I would say, because the hand moves when you have uh, different attachments um, or if you have different foregrips and stuff, there is like a bunch of different um, poses for the hand. And that would change, you know, where the, the thumb would be. So it wouldn't really be like you can have the thumb in one place, 
that would severely limit um, the customization there. Uh, but yeah, it, it would certainly be possible, and I have given it a lot of thought, like how would we do that if we were to do it? Lucius A has another question. I have seen dynamic animations in the game. I mean, if, for example, when you look down, hands move, or when you get close to the wall, gun and hand turns around. How do you do that, and do you create each by combining them in game engine? Yeah, it's all done procedurally. Like, that's all Albarnis realm, which is, it's all the technical animation stuff that comes into, you take what I'm making here, which is a very specific, very, like, artistic piece of work, um, that it, it's certainly going to look nice in context of, you know, standing still. But once you start moving, once you start sprinting, like they say, when you move to a wall, you need to start layering stuff and you need to figure out ways of making everything very lively. And there's a very good video from, I think, a year back where Albarni talks about exactly how he did that and what kind of inspirations he had from different games uh, to get the gunplay to feel the way uh, it does. So I really recommend that if you go to, I think it's our YouTube channel, the Afray YouTube channel, and go back to, I think it's like a year ago, uh, you'll find something about the gunplay, and there it is. Like, all the stuff that you might want to know uh, directly from the guy who made it. So here's a little fun question. Um, James Cameron walks into you both, Anders and Samir. He says, I have unlimited money to make whatever you want to do. This is your dream project. <laughs> what would you do? Oh, damn. <laughs> Man, I, I really want to make something um, basically like we're doing in 5K, just more of it. Like, I want to work on this until it's like it's encapsulating both the cqb elements the sniping elements all of the stuff that's like uh, everyone talks about the perfect tactical shooter and it never happens either because it's like different uh, visions or uh, limited budget or whatever um and you have like arma 3 for example which is i guess the closest you'll get to covering most of it maybe not all um so yeah just trying to make what arma 4 i guess would be like in a very expandable kind of package, maybe like Garry's mod, where you sort of have a really good baseline for all of that stuff, ballistics, movement, whatever, uh, good AI, you know, um, capability of uh, playing on big maps, of course, all of the stuff that you want, and then just have that released so people can actually make, you know, the kind of uh, what Garry's mod became, uh, but in like a tactical shooter. That would be like my dream project, I think. Yeah, honestly, pretty much what everything of honors has said. Like, if, if James Cameron is here with us, if you can hear us, help us make a more mature version of this project. Because we have lots of ideas and we need a way to execute them. So if you give us your money, we could do it. Exactly. Right on. The dream for the tech, the dream for the tactical shoot, the perfect tactical shooter goes on and on. <laughs> That's what I've been hearing exactly. a lot is that uh, everyone wants the perfect tactical shooter, but nobody quite knows how to uh, achieve it or what they need for it. Yeah, exactly. It won't happen, I think, because it's just too much stuff it's in very one game. Relative. Yeah. If you ever played one of those strategy games where they also combine FPS elements, it's the same thing. It's like a childhood dream that sort of doesn't work in real life because you just get too much stuff into one game and it doesn't work and it's not going to be playable on any decent computer that people have and so on. It's just like, yeah, great idea. Execution wise, it's probably not, uh, yeah. So another question was asked about melee combat. Is there plans to add katana, sword, axe, warhammer? And uh, how is melee combat animation different from uh, firearm animation? Yeah, no, I think so. I think we already kind of set um, a good standard with like the pipe and the knife and stuff where we've tried, uh, you know, different ways of getting the melee to work. It's still pretty early 
and pretty um like it's janky in some cases but it's it's certainly something that would be very similar to like chivalry i guess like they had a really nice thing where you can kind of swing back and forth and hold the key and time it and stuff uh and it's really differing from guns because it's more about getting velocity and understanding um how it's physically interacting with the environment so you can't really just make a nice looking animation here and call it a day um you just have to make a really shitty animation in here and go into engine and play with it and say okay is, is this swinging fast enough is it swinging in the right way is it you know registering the hits all of that stuff and then yeah in that way it just differs greatly you just end up with something that's like very very different So when do you say you like know you're done or finished with an animation? I see you're working on this bad boy here. Um, what percentage would you say this is done and uh, what more needs to be finished? Oh, a lot. So what I'm doing now is that uh, at a certain point, I ended up getting um, uh, very into like doing everything at once, uh, even though what I'm actually doing is that I'm doing a block out, which is to say I'm trying to get like pacing between different elements to a certain point like this part for example feels very fast to me right now and it feels very strange um so i'll leave that alone because it's during blockout and at the same time i'm doing like a polished kind of mag throw i'm trying to figure out the speed of that um so i'm basically just multitasking as i'm working here uh, doing many things at once and i know i'm done when i don't see any more uh things that i want to change basically like right now i'm seeing like 15 things when i look at it like oh my god that magazine is going out in the wrong way and it's going in the wrong direction and it's feeling very slow and then fast and it's awful and yuck right like when i still have that feeling there is more work to be done <laughs> So do you think you'd ever try any other areas of animation or is like, you know, you, you, you're zeroing in on the guns uh, the, that that's like uh, uh, your, your main passion or are there other areas you like to explore like creature or character animation? No, absolutely. And, and uh, like I said, when it started, it's like uh, my job here is currently not really doing this kind of stuff. This is more like uh, a treat, really, because we're uh, my job is lead animator, which is more or less you're uh, the person that's trying to make everyone else uh, have a good time doing their job and making everything run smooth and kind of keeping a steady eye on like okay what is the overall vision for the animation team and so on so it's like that is my actual job day to day and then this is more what i do when i do freelance work or if i'm like now uh, lucky enough to do a live stream and i'm able to do work on this uh you know for several hours uh, so yeah, it's it's definitely something I enjoy doing and learning more about because um, I tried doing some creature animations. I tried working on mocap cleanup for quite a bit now, and it's it's fun in its own right. It's it's a very different kind of work, and uh, it differs in the sense that it doesn't require you to have this kind of expert uh, thinking, right? Like you're you're not thinking about guns and just like oh my god, this little bolt on this gun is so important. You're thinking more about like the big picture, just looking at the movements, looking at, you know, um, how it's going to perform in the game, like all of that stuff where it's just more uh, general. And this is certainly a part of that. You have to make this into something that's just, uh, you know, working in game and so on, but it's really getting into the gun nerdy stuff as well, which is the part that I, of course, enjoy uh, quite a bit. Uh, M. Nikon asks, is there any updates coming to the third person animations? Yeah, uh, continuously. Like we had motion capture stuff coming out now. Um, we're still tweaking a bunch of stuff there um, and figuring out stuff um, like, for example, how to stop and start when you move. That's a big thing that we have been working on for a long time now and getting you know, like 
basically polished up to a point where it's just gonna work with our uh, speed in the game, like the way that we move, how do we deal with jumping, uh, vaulting and mantling is a thing that we're working on, of course, been, uh, you know, added and removed from the game a couple of times where we're testing it and it's like, yeah, all of that stuff is coming down to, um, uh, yeah. It, it's it's basically just yes, and it's going to probably continue continuously be developed until the very end of development. Like, it's always a thing that we're trying to get better. Question, you're all going to have a rebellion if you don't add flame flurs, like, uh, and they're going to stick you on spikes. Uh, what is oh, your damn. response to the non flamethrower rebellion? I guess we need to have flamethrowers. It's certainly possible to do as a mod, but yeah, uh, like I said, we, we would require someone with uh, a lot of particle effects kind of experience uh, to do a really good one. Uh, I've seen plenty of them in Arma to see that it's like, yeah, you can add the model, but then, yeah, if you don't have the effects, it's like, yeah. And yeah, it's more the, so how it interacts with the environment. Yeah, animation for like the guy getting flamed, I guess. Like that's more important than actual animation of the gun or the flamethrower, I guess. Because that's gonna be very different. It's not like it's just gonna ragdoll, right? You need to have intense screaming and, and terrible things happening, right? So it's like, yeah, and, and burn details uh, on like sand area, yeah, exactly. Like that stuff is just uh, it's probably not going to be an animation project at that point. It's like the full studio going full tilt at something that's more particles and models and programming and so on. Uh, Drassel asks, is incorporating mocap usually easy or is it a challenge on its own? Yeah, it's a challenge, definitely. Like, typically what mocap is, is that it's a really nice capture of someone doing what you want. And then you sit there cleaning that up to make it look correct because maybe the feet were recorded in such a way that you don't really get the perfect detail um, or you want to change it. So it's like, instead of a meter tall box you're jumping, it's like two meters. It's it's very technical and it's very annoying to work with. And it's just, it, it's a very, I have a lot of respect for the people that specialize in that. Just to say that, like, it's just, that's the kind of thing. Uh, if you're good at motion capture cleanup and understand the kind of work that goes into that, oh my God, you're like a champion. Like, it's so boring and so incredibly, like, uh, skillful at the same time, yeah. So, as industry professionals, here's a question I, I want to ask. Why is Deborah Wilson, formerly from Mad TV, like the prime uh, acting and mocap actor of our generation? Like, I see her showing up in all every video game, and you know, on one hand, I'm like happy to see her succeed, but I'm just wondering, like, what is she doing? What what is her special sauce? Why is she the, the animators love to work with her? <laughs> Good question. HB asks, have you ever pushed for something to be added because it would be fun to animate? Yeah, all the time. And I think the, the thing in our studio as well is that we're kind of like working as, uh, you know, a bunch of individuals and a group. So the individuals like me and Samir, for example, are always talking about the guns. Always. Like, and, and that's the thing that just, it won't stop. It, it's never going to be like we're not talking about uh, what other firearms that we want or that we, we need to have all of these details on the firearms because that's so important and so on. So it's, yeah, it's um, anything from like, we need to have, um, you know, more, like you guys said, like more uh, variants of guns. Like we need to change our pistol grips, which is like, okay, why? <laughs> um, or, or it could be stuff like um, when we did like a full revamp of all of the ammunition types, like, yeah, maybe we need to have steel casing for the ammunition at some point so let's make it or hey we need to have skins you know like we're we're gonna have a full skin system um because we want that and and again i can't really say if we're gonna have it or not like it's just what i want personally and we continuously want to like bring that to the table and say what we want and yeah it's such a nice place to work just because of that as well uh that we're allowed to do that and they're not like <laughs> yelling at us for you know only talking about one thing Is there a plan to add any other LMGs to the game? Additionally, would there be more detailed guide on weapon attachments, like how they affect uh, guns in certain ways? 
Absolutely. Like, we're basically just... Uh, we have added so many attachments that's like, okay, can we do this? Yes. Okay. If so, why? Um, how? Uh, let's try a bunch of stuff and see how it works. And at this point, yeah. Um, I think all of the attachments would get uh, revamped to realism levels. Like, okay, what exactly does... Uh, let, let's say that you have a suppressor on the gun and you try to figure out how does that affect the gameplay. Um, it could give you more recoil because it's more gas coming back. It could give you less recoil because uh, you could say that it's a flow through suppressor, for example. Um, and it could be like um, we're working with uh, what do you call those, like the muscle uh, dampeners, not the, the, the brakes. That's the word, yeah. The muscle brakes. So those are really interesting. And then we start talking about how could they be you know, incorporated into this um, because they should give you uh, what I suggested way back was that we need more camera shake because when I use them in real life, they're really annoying to use because they give you a lot of concussion, which is like, okay, how do you make that happen in the game? Well, camera shake concussion is like oh, oof, annoying feeling. Someone is, let's say someone is blowing like uh, pressured air straight into your eyeballs. That's kind of the feeling that you get from shooting <laughs> with a, a muscle break inside. It's like very annoying. Uh, but it gives you less recoil. So it's like, okay, let's try to make that a thing and so on. So it's like we're continuously going to make the attachments uh, work for the game, like just figure out how they can work and how we can actually do that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there was a second part of that question that I missed, sorry. Uh, let me see uh, if I could pull it up. Um, ooh, it's going a little too fast now, uh, but we do have another question. Yeah. Do you guys have any military? Do you have any military consultants Sorry, yeah. working with you at Afray or tac uh, for tactics or weapon handling? Um, yes and no. Um, like I personally, <laughs> I guess my friends are kind of doing that, but it's um. Oh wow, there's a lot of people writing about the minigun. Yeah, they they, they really want to know about that minigun. I was, yeah. I was gonna let you finish that one and then bring that yeah. up, but uh, uh yeah, yeah, I guess finish yeah, that and then. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. It, yeah, I think like internally in our team, no, or yes, a little bit, but it's it's mostly just me uh, talking to my friends, like in uh, the home guard or uh, in military service there in Norway, or just uh, you know in different countries. Like just yeah, we, we all have the kind of same approach to firearms when it comes to just the pure like mechanic of firearms. Like most military people are not really that interested, to be honest. Like you have people that have used a particular firearm because they were issued it and that's it. And they know that one um, and they know the quirks of that particular firearm. Um, and then you will have people like competition shooters where they're uh, either very particular about a very particular gun or they're very like broad and know a lot of guns. And then when you come together, it's all about just, okay, the mechanics of what is existing. Red dots on pistols, for example, is like, okay, let's talk about that for military purposes. It's, 50 50 where people say yeah that's garbage because they break and they don't work and if you get them wet or snowy they're gonna you know uh, turn this pistol into you know uh just a paperweight it's not gonna work and you're not gonna be able to aim or it's gonna be amazing because i use this in competition and it just works flawlessly every time uh and so on and so forth it's like it depends on who you ask and we try to kind of get uh different perspectives as we're working on the game uh, having said that, though, we also have a very strict policy of, like, if it's fun, we also have it in the game. Like, we're not going with realism. We have a case for, you know, the Americans, and even though they might argue that they're, like, Arsenal AKs, like, made in the US, maybe, or uh, Kalashnikov uh, Group USA or whatever, uh, sure. But it's still, yeah, it's, it's basically just getting to a point where we're talking to people that know particular things if we need to know and we're also discussing stuff from do we really want it to be realistic or fun and just yeah have all of those arguments uh, continuously kind of come together well said would there be anything added into the game that is limited ammo that could you can get throughout the raids example grenade launchers uh flamethrower minigun um so, uh, flamethrower. Pro I mean, you got the answer for that, but I think the the, the limited ammo uh, yeah. is a good idea, interesting thing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, yeah, sure. If it's a gun that's 
uh, let's say that the SCP Foundation made like a prototype or something, and that's the ammo that they had because they made the ammo in house. They loaded it themselves, and that's it. That's all you get. Yeah, sure, right. It's it all needs to just come down to uh, what is realistic in or how can you explain why that is, right? Like it shouldn't be like this annoying thing where you pick something up and then you try to pick up ammo and it doesn't work and you get annoyed and it's like okay why um so yeah it's it's definitely something that would be very interesting to do it just needs to happen in the right way Would there be any other underbarrel alternative weapons, like a skeleton key for breaching doors or locked doors, or maybe an underbarrel grenade launcher? Um, I, I'm not really sure because we have discussed it. Yes, it, it's like one of those obvious things where a lot of games have it. Uh, same with the grenade launchers, like you say, uh, or even uh, an RPG or something like it's depending on if it would be viable to use in our game. Um, and I guess the answer is yeah, maybe. Um, it certainly would be possible. Like it's not uh, out of the question, and it would just require some uh, technical setup and, of course, making the model and so on. But yeah, why not? Um, I think the reason why we don't have so many grenade launchers and stuff is like, well, you're in a CQB environment. We're not really doing the whole ready or not thing with like, um, uh, you know, smoke or um, a gas or whatever. Like it's it's. It sort of have to have a reason to be there. And explosive grenade launchers inside is like, well, why? <laughs> you would kill yourself and the team and all of the zombies. And then, yeah, it's fun, sure. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, it doesn't make too much sense. Secret Agent uh, Pancake asks, uh, scopes look really freaking cool. If you do uh, do any work on those, how do you go about trying to recapture uh, something like that? Oh, that's a that's a really good Albarni question. I'm sorry it's not there because that's like he spent so much time with me sitting like uh, I basically bought a bunch of optics like an ACOG and a couple of different LPVOs and stuff where we just looked at those together and we tried to like dissect the lenses and the way the um, uh, how do you say like the um, the different shadows comes in. And you have an eye box and you have these different things that layers on top of each other and the reticle is in there somewhere and it has to be in a certain order it's crazy and he has probably done like let's say 10 to 20 iterations at this point of just making it slightly better every time um and the really cool thing is that he has made that without any use of the picture in picture stuff that you typically see um not to say that we don't want picture in picture it's just that it's more performant that's one thing and it's also um the fact that there was some sort of like technical issues with using picture in picture that may or may not be resolved i'm not really sure uh but it's like just very very impressive to me at least to see um that he was able to make something with like i <laughs> i never seen anyone do that with those kinds of optics uh without using picture in picture like it's very very cool and it was a lot of uh trial and error and looking at different optics like i said uh, research, basically. Charbrose asks, what are the plans for the tools section of the weapon selection category? I've been curious what uh, would be added in that category and how to interact in-game. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's probably coming uh, into that kind of ready or not discussion, right, where we're talking about flashbangs and you talk about breaching tools and whatnot. Um, because it is a CQB game, or CQB game after all. Um, so, yeah. It's like anything that you might imagine uh, tools that you would need in a tactical situation, I would say. Um, I'm not really sure exactly what that would mean yet. Um, and if I'm even, you know, certain to say anything specific, but it's definitely within the realm of like tactics um, and yeah, stuff that you might see in a CQB environment, I would say. Harry Potter, or HB, asks, have you guys considered 
adding improvised tools, perhaps things like craftable Molotovs. Uh oh, crafting system inbound. Watch out. <laughs> yeah, oh, that would be cool. I mean, uh, probably not just from the top of my head, but uh, who knows? Um, yeah, it, it, it's yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think it would be a very good idea if you want to keep the game in its current kind of uh, playstyle. Like, it would take a lot away from the actual gunplay and just have you run around, collect stuff, and then spend a lot of time making ammo types or, or craftables and whatnot. I, yeah, I can't really imagine that being a thing. But that's me personally. I don't know. Bill Microsoft asks, will you be able to use the iron sights on the E-Clan uh, e or the mounted RMR on the ACOG in the future? Ah, like a piggyback optic? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think we even made a model for that at some point, and it's like, uh, it's like one of those canted sights, but just a different take on it. Um, uh, we're also talking, of course, then about like LPVOs with different zoom levels, um, uh, magnifiers. It's just, yeah. Sandstorm did all of that stuff, and it's it's certainly possible we have plans of how we would do that kind of thing with animations or without, depending on how technical we want to go. Um, yeah, and once, or actually since we already have a really good optics platform, it's just about making the models, making slightly different variants of that, um, and also having a reason to have it at this point in time, like, yeah, but why? Right, because we have the counter sites, we have the ACOGs and whatnot, and adding more optics is always cool. And then, yeah, just finding the right time for that, I think, is going to be uh, the answer to that. Yes, but maybe not right now. I think you already asked, uh, answered part of this, but uh, the other part uh, is uh, new. Are there any plans to add any additional LMGs and shotguns to the game? I don't think we've asked shotguns yet. Yeah, a good uh, question. Um, yeah, I mean, we only have tube feds, uh, which is the 590 Mossberg and the 1014. And honestly, yeah, I'd like to see a Saiga 12 or one of those fancy new AR platform shotguns. Like, there's a bunch of stuff out there uh, that certainly makes sense. Um, it's also kind of difficult to say if that would kind of break the point of a tube fed, but then you're getting into uh, like the technicalities of like, okay, what is fun and what is just like way overpowered in real life and how would you balance that? Yeah, like Kel says, it's like we, we tried that in ISMC and you just got like, yeah, there's a reason why NWI probably never added like magazine fed shotguns in their game. Um, you don't want to reduce the damage, obviously. There is no real reason to use a tube fed unless we're using particular types of ammo or but maybe i mean maybe if we do like um uh let's say that we do like double feed kind of uh speed reloads for the tube fed so it goes really quickly and you're very limited in the capacity that you can carry on uh, magazine fed shotguns because it's like when you start thinking about how much ammo you actually get in a magazine, it's not that much. Like, you get maybe like 5 to 10 rounds in a box magazine, uh, and you would need to reload constantly. Uh, doing something like a big drum would be out of the question after the first... Uh, like, if you go in with a drum, sure, and then you drop it, and then you don't have that anymore. Yeah, so there's ways of maybe making that happen um, somehow balanced, but at the same time it would be better i guess than the tube fed so it's like yeah yes awesome but yeah how <laughs> like if you go in with a drum sure and then you drop it and then you don't have that so another question from drassel I don't know how feasible it would be, but making the gunplay around shotgun revolve around switching ammo types on the fly uh, with the use of cartridge shells and uh, the gun would be pretty dope. Is that possible or is that kind of technically unfeasible? It's, yeah, it's a good question, right? Because it comes down also to uh, types of ammo in uh, other guns. Like I said, if we had, for example, a whole system where it's like, yeah, you have these types of ammo for a particular enemy, 
um, or for not over penetrating a wall or something like yeah, it's it's feasible, uh, but it uh, it just depends on what we're doing with this game, right? Like at that point, you're talking about so much. Let's look at Tarko for example, right? Where it's <laughs> it's really just a whole thing to just understand the ammo types they have in the game, and we don't even have that kind of depth in terms of like why you would not just pick the best ammo. Why would you not just go with like uh, hollow points all the time if you're fighting uh, creatures, and then always just do armor piercing if you're just fighting humans and just you know shoot an additional shot or something. It's 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 a whole thing where when you start talking about armor systems and ammo types and stuff in games, we absolutely didn't get it right in ISMC, and we also started realizing the same with like the tube fed shotguns. No, the magazine fed shotguns that is like, yeah, how do you actually make that a thing without making it just overpowered as heck and just, yeah, it, it's a very, very hard uh, thing to make work. So it would be cool, maybe like specific ammo types for the shotgun and then you switch and then have one in the chamber and yeah, it's doable, but it's just, yeah, it needs to be done in a, a good way, I guess. One question is, um, have you thought about adding a COD zombie-style game mode? The point system would go to buying ammo, meds, friendly AI, or would that be too arcadey? Um, I mean, I can just speak for my personal uh, like uh, preference, but yes and no, I guess. Like, I'm all for making mods. Like, if, if we have the base for making different ways of playing 5K uh, viable, if you just change, for example... Uh, the time to kill, uh, or add in uh, different game modes like that. Yeah, absolutely. It it just depends on, um, you know, what kind of direction the game goes in. And you can always like try to force players, which is one thing that is very annoying to me. At least when I play, for example, Ready or Not, and you don't get the sprint. Um, if you start doing that, if you start limiting the player to what they can do and say, oh, it's too arcade or it's too realistic or whatnot then you're sort of just missing the point because people will play the game the way that they want regardless and then you should just be open to all the possibilities regarding like okay this is gonna be a tactical shooter the way that we think is correct and then you could change all of that which i think you can right now like there is some stuff you can change in the configs and stuff uh, albarney has always been like a huge uh fan of just getting mod support uh, as early as possible even though it's not that possible yet um, and also just like, okay, you want to change the game to feel like a different thing? Sure, go ahead. Here's the time to kill. Here's the speed that you run. Here's the uh, ADS time. Here's like all of the different things. And you can change it to your server. And you just put in the server's description that this is like an archaic, arcade experience. Or this is like a realistic experience. Uh, so yeah, I don't think it's a good idea to kind of limit it. I think it's, we should have all of the options if we can. Then people will make what they like, uh, and then, yeah, just put it in the description of the server that this is what we want you to do when you play with us. HP asks, uh, likely already been asked, but what will be the most SC fun SCP to animate? Oh, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of cool ones. Um, I've seen, for example, uh, uh, when we work on stuff where it's like multiple limbs or very like, uh, you know, spaced out kind of uh, things happening. That's fun, right? Because it's not that grounded and it's like a very different way of working. Uh, so I would imagine something like, um, uh, I don't know what exists out there, but let's say it's like a, an a eight-headed creature with like two tails that can fly and also walk and it's like yeah you just go crazy right to just do anything um because that's where it comes down to just if you want a really good challenge in animation it's like trying to expand uh your understanding of what is possible to do like i'm very 
<laughs> I'm very particular to this thing, but I'm, I'm not that good an animator, really, because I just know how to do this one thing. And if I want to become a good animator, I need to do that kind of stuff, like learn how to do creatures and a lot of creatures. Uh, learn the essentials of like uh, how to do birds and how to do flying creatures and how they move and how to do uh, quadrupedals and bipedals, uh, you know, different legged creatures. Uh, gather reference in a good way and so on. It's like that's the kind of uh, thing that I would like to do if I uh, continue this uh, uh, well adventure down the road here. It's uh, yeah, a lot more to learn. The Omicron asks, do you want to add some shotgun as a secondary weapon? I mean, there are small shotguns, shotgun revolvers, for an example, the Serbu Super Shorty or Taros Judge. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of in the same vein as like, okay, why not have uh, the AS Val as a secondary? Like, we we have a lot of information online where you can see that from time to time you see people carry two primaries, um, and it's a viable option, like sniper rifles, or uh, in the AS Val's case, it's because it's a very different caliber and it's subsonic, so it's not really viable in normal firefights and so on. Uh, so, yeah, why not? Um, it also kind of comes back to the modding kind of scene, right? Where it's like, you don't really get that in normal Insurgency Sandstorm. But in ISMC, we ended up having like two primaries because why not? It's fun. Uh, I think in some variants of the mod, we had like limited to MP7s, MP5Ks, like you said, super shorty, whatever we could get our hands on in terms of like, yeah, you could probably carry that uh, on a sling and it wouldn't be too bad. Uh, but yeah, it's like, Sure, uh, but would you and why and would how would you make it so you don't always go with two guns? Like maybe it makes it very slow, but that's not fun. So yeah, I don't know. Having lots of weapons are cool, but then how do you balance them? Yeah, exactly. And why would you pick one? Like, if you just go with a sniper rifle and an assault rifle or something every time, or two LMGs like we did in ISMC, like, okay, <laughs> then you kind of broke the game because then there is no point in carrying different weapons, which is already kind of a thing in our game, right? Where why do you pick an SMG? Like, you obviously want to have something with more firepower. You pick the assault rifle. And yeah, we're trying to figure that out. Why? Why do we have the MP5 SD, which sucks? <laughs> You you could think about it as something that is freedom of choice, which is correct. Yeah. But then every decision that you put in, every every object that you can use against someone like force on force, it comes with its con consequence, like those shotguns, those mag fed shotguns. It's a much easier platform to use than a, you know, pop loaded shotgun. And so... It, it comes with all that those challenges where should you tweak damage fall off or actual damage itself, magazine count, uh, stuff like that. So complicated. Exactly. Uh, it gets very sad as well because if you start messing too much with that stuff, you end up with like typical thing is that the shotguns get super nerfed and you have to be like 10 feet away to actually get the shots, which is not what we want to do to 5k. Um, but at the same time, when you do that, it's like there is no real reason to pick something that's not as lethal as possible, right? Uh, so yeah, it's 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 more like fun, kind of, okay, let's try something different if you pick uh, worse guns in that case. Very interesting question. Would weapon malfunctions be added at all? And hypothetically, let's say they were, how would you go about animating that? I, I, it's very rare, but like I remember... Um, Far Cry 2 kind of had something like that. Yeah, it depends on the like kind of ammo uh, that you use in your guns. Uh, in my experience, at least, when I get malfunctions on my pistol, it's like when I buy, uh, you know, cheap ass crap ammo, uh, and I tend to set my gun up in such a way that it doesn't actually like all types of ammo. Like my firing pin is not that strong, um, just to get a light, nice, crisp uh, trigger pull. Um, so in that, those cases, sure, yeah, but we are talking military firearms here where they're probably not going to jam unless you give them something like a really bad treatment. So in our game, maybe, I mean, like you say in Far Cry 2, it's because you're getting 
well, like I said, crappy ass ammo and crappy ass guns that's rusted to hell. Uh, that's been used like 50 years. This is like you're getting a fresh off the rack SG553, for example. Like this one is not going to jam on you, especially with the ammo that we basically we invented. I think it even says if I can get close here. We invented like the whole uh, where do uh, these guys get their ammo from, and it's from. I don't think the AK ammo is produced by them. It's like this is probably like surplus uh, Soviet era ammo, and then most other ammo is like produced by a made up production company like AK Productions or something, which is like okay, that's gonna be prime ammo, like just really good ammo, uh, not any surplus kind of cheap military bullshit. It's just gonna work every time. Um, so it's yeah. It, we're basically setting up the game in such a way that it would be very, very unlikely for it to have jams in general. And then if it did, it, it's fun, I guess, but it's also like, yeah, it, it's how do you make that not annoying? It's also a question, right? Like, how do you make it so people don't get annoyed, like in the middle of a firefight? It's like, why did it jam now? <laughs> I don't know. It, it It's my take on it as well, like just... I personally don't like when it jams. It looks very cool, but it's not like a thing that's particularly realistic or uh, something that I enjoy when I play. That 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 question is interesting to me, and I'm gonna ask you guys back a question to the people that were asking about the jamming feature being possibly added. I assume you've played Escape from Tarkov. And I have, you know, lived through the actual jamming feature. How did that feel like to you? And do you actually think it added anything to the gameplay loop? Apart from, no, it's annoying. Can you come up with a different answer? Right on. I agree with that. So just out of curiosity, I'm kind of curious to get your thoughts. Have either of you heard of Commander Carl or seen him on YouTube? He's like an animator who does these like kind of joke animations um and what's your opinion of him if you've heard of oh, him is that the guy who's like using uh, home appliances to reload or is that someone else yeah yeah that's, yeah, the, that's the guy the... he has like all oh, these like kind of like, like him yeah kind of yeah. like ridiculous home appliances and he does like reloading uh, hair dryer, for example yeah there is vacuum cleaner yeah that's awesome <laughs> i like it uh, from a technical aspect as well, you talk about like the style that we're talking about here, like it's realism versus like cool looking animations. That's exactly it. Like what he does is it's basically like showcasing what a cool animation is, even without using a gun, right? Like you don't need a gun to make it look snappy and awesome and just reborn. Uh, so that's the thing that we're working with here uh, in addition to realism. Charboose Bruce asks, uh, any possible joke weapons like a water gun? And uh, how, how would uh, animating how would you approach animating a water gun differently from uh, the work you're doing right now? <laughs> I think I would look at, uh, yeah, basically just trying to figure out a fun way to do that in real life, make some reference. Uh, yeah, definitely just, uh, again, when you have these kinds of... Uh, basically just exaggerated kind of movements that you're doing in animation. You can do that with anything. You could take a toothbrush or whatever and just like, boom, bam, super awesome, uh, snappy movements and just make it look really cool. Um, so you don't need a gun, uh, as we just talked about, right? Like just you need uh, cool looking movements and so on. And that's pretty much uh, all you need. Ooh, this is interesting. Piss Whistle asks, I feel like it gives more realism. I have served in the army for three years and I've had my weapons malfunction every once in a while. While I play realistic shooters that do not have the, that feature, it makes me question things. All right, so that was more of a comment, but it was an interesting feedback to your um, uh, response about it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And uh, that's the thing where, uh, unless we're actually moving this game uh, outside uh, into basically the real world, right? Because we're a lot... Uh, we're basically just looking at a group of people that's inside using pristine guns with pristine ammo. 
Um, the moment that we take this into the forest or into the desert or whatever, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like you can get shit into your gun, um, and and that's gonna also affect it. Like we talked about during ISMC that if we had the option to actually do some programming there, uh, why not try to like add the more you prone, the more chance it is that the gun gets like dusted up uh, in a sense, and you make a texture based on like the AO, basically like you take all of the crevices and you fill it with sand and you get that kind of thing where it's like, oh wow, you are actually at this point making your gun jam because you're doing something. Uh, like Samir said, you're, you're not really just getting jammed randomly, you're you're causing that to happen as a player and it's a fun, interesting yes. thing and you have to, like, do you want to stay on the ground all the time and drag your gun through the mud or do you want to try to keep it clean, right? And then figure out if you want to take it to water or something to kind of clean it out. There's so many things that you can do, but this guy, absolutely, I don't disagree that guns do jam and they jam in environments that's probably a little more filthy than what we're using right now. Like inside, well, there's carpet with dust, like, okay, is that going to cause the gun to jam? Right, it's, yeah, so it depends. I was going to say that the thing you said on is about the prone. That's very interesting. That could be a, a way to kind of counter the people who prone too much or for too long. Yeah. So the counter would be to that. Why would you keep players to from proning? You know, let them have their fun. Exactly. And, and you know, it's complicated. Yeah, you can really it's get interesting. you can get to a really cool uh, kind of balance where. Uh, if you want to keep your gun clean, you have to just make gameplay rules based on that, right? Like, it's a lot of stuff that you can do there uh, to really make it uh, interesting, I think. But it has to be done in such a way that it's not just like, okay, jam, the gun jammed, whoops. Yeah, there's, there has to, yeah. has to be a reason behind, like Tarkov, because you have to actually take care of your gun. If you don't take care, it's going to jam. Makes sense. Yeah, in our game, it's like, yeah, you get a new gun every time, or you pick up a gun every, like, what? five minutes or something like if we start yeah. <laughs> looking at how often people actually just swap out guns yeah i, I don't think that's going to be a thing ah uh, here's a popular question have you considered adding special ammunition like slugs hollow point or incendiary yeah um we sort of answered that already with the um, whole discussion about the shotguns and the ammo types where it would be cool, but then we're getting into the whole discussion as I'm seeing the guys there uh, discussing like armor systems and so on. Uh, I, again, I still haven't seen that done right, including Tarkov. Like, okay, how do you do that? Do you do it like a bar that fills up and you have to use a certain ammo type to break through? Or do you have, uh, you know, different benefits to certain ammo types? Sure. Um, I think that's the closest at least I got to getting a good idea for uh, ammo types is that, yeah, maybe you have mostly hollow points for creatures, mostly armor piercing for, uh, you know, other humans, because pretty much all of the people that you meet have uh, either Kevlar or ceramic plates or steel or whatever. Like, we just need to imagine or, uh, you know, reinvent, I guess, the guards or whoever we're fighting to the point where it's like, yeah, you need this particular ammo type to fight these types of people. But then you run into the problem of like, okay, during a raid, how often do you get to change your ammo? Do you get different magazines? Do you have to change them in real time? Do you pick up different ammo and then swap out the cartridges in those magazines? It's like you you hear what I'm going with, right? It's just you get to a point where it's, it's going to change so much of the game. Um, and again, I, I don't think I come to a conclusion where it's like, this is going to work. I like the idea. It's more like, oh, that sounds like a bunch of problems that I'm not really sure how to fix. Um, but it's certainly cool. Like, yeah, it's a realistic thing and so on. And uh, yeah, hard to say. Ideas are always cool, but how do you execute them? That's the problem. Yeah, exactly.
M. Nikon asks, have you guys thought about adding anonymous weapons uh, where something like that broken AK you had for a while has a reason for being broken uh, like that, uh, but it would work normally? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I an mean, uh, anomalous, uh, anomalous. I think that's or... what they meant. Yeah, exactly. And, and you have all of these things from the SCP lore uh, where it would certainly be real cool. And I, I'm not against the idea at all. Um, it would go into the whole like fantasy weapon kind of thing where uh, uh, how would that fit into, uh, you know, our lore? Like, would it be as good as a gun? Typical, like, uh, let's say, ballistic gun? Or would it be like an energy weapon? Would it be something completely different? Yeah, it, it's a difficult uh, question. It would be cool. That's probably the best question or answer I can give. It's like, yeah, cool idea, but yeah. So we've had a very generous uh, stream going for over two hours now. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I guess, uh, how are you guys feeling? You want to go for like another 20 minutes or you feel strong or um, uh, how's, you, how's your momentum feeling? Oh, for me, it's like uh, <laughs> the work is just getting started. Uh, but yeah, no, absolutely. Like if uh, people are not sick of hearing my voice, we can go a little bit more. Uh, yeah, we, all right. Pe yeah, people we, seem to be enjoying it. Um, we will uh, oh, keep on awesome. going. It. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that I, you know, being considerate to your needs. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's an interesting conversation because from from the questions I've been seeing, it's often about adding something new. Yeah, and. It's it's interesting where people want to go with things. You know, uh, people are more prone to being more military with uh, jamming or attachment choices, being able to use pressure pads. Uh, some are more going for the SCP side of things. You know, has the interaction with monsters, and I find that really interesting. In that, with the amount of people we have on this stream, you can kind of segment uh, the interests people have for the game. Exactly, and and we have very like two different worlds colliding there, right? Where the kind of stuff me and Samir enjoys is like very much <laughs> uh, tactical shooters, guns, and then uh, we have learned to like the SCP side, uh, but that's certainly not like the part that we're uh, most interested in or where we came from. But it's it's very cool to see that it can indeed exist together. And honestly, I think anything that's like knowledge based. It can exist very nicely together, right? Because you're talking about being interested in uh, making stuff authentic and at the same time have all of these amazing, like, uh, fantasy based sci fi things happening, which is like, how do you even do that? And it's such a cool kind of experiment to even uh, attempt that. <laughs> I saw one question there where I can ask really quickly about me and Samir's, uh, like, other projects. Um, I think I mentioned it before, but we have worked on, what is it, Samir? Like ISMC, uh, OHD, Operation Hearts Doorstop, the Blue Drake game. Uh, mm -hmm. We have worked on Ground Branch. We have worked on uh, Beautiful Light. That's right. Anything else? I don't think we did some like commissions, like private commissions, and that's about it, I think. And of course, yeah, SP if I can. Yeah. yeah. So here's my question. Um, one thing that always kind of felt like it kind of hits the same sort of tactical and horror uh, is the Resident Evil franchise. What do you think of the animations um, and execution of Resident Evil compared to other tactical shooters? Oh, I mean, I like them. They're uh, at least for, uh, I think I played uh, Village and I thought that it was kind of getting into the World of Warfare thing with their dual mag reloads and stuff. Uh, but it's certainly a very different uh, take on the genre, right? Like, uh, what I would like from those games is like, yeah, one-shot kills, um, really good, uh, like, single-fire kind of things, and you go in as a team and you do stuff. So it's like, I'm not really 
the right person to kind of go for that style. But for what they're doing, it's amazing. Like, it's really cool that they're trying to kind of mix uh, the tactical elements, as you say, and like, oh my god, the models uh, they used for, I think it was the Special Forces. Was it in Village Samir? Like, the guys that have the snow jacket, like the... Oh, the, yeah. the winter unit. Yeah, the winter unit. Oh my god, like, we looked at that so much when it came out. I think it's called Wolfhound. Yeah, exactly, like, that is sick. Just sick. So cool. Um, yeah, so, so it's like they, they got some stuff right, absolutely, but it's more... I think the gunplay and everything, it's not really... Like, it, it's not the same kind of game, uh, at least to me. It's more just... Uh, it looks really cool, and then when you play it, it's more... Uh, RPG, maybe? Like, it's unrealistic, low damage, and so on, so, yeah. So I know you guys have a wonderful background with um, the area of, um, you know, working with like military animations. Uh, what is your background and uh, relationship to SCP? So for me, it was actually the first time I heard about uh, SCP when I started working here. Before that, we had almost exclusively worked on like realistic uh, shooters. Um, and uh, it kind of dawned on me while we, while we were like talking about joining this that it's not that different from working on a tactical shooter like just with humans when you also incorporate uh you know creatures anomalies um just general atmosphere i guess and then you try to just play the same kind of way in that environment it's a really cool idea i think and once we we get to a certain point where it's like the game feels the way that we want it to feel and and it's just like now we have everything in order i think it's going to be very very fun to play like it's going to be all of those elements coming together in one place like again what i would want from like i said when you play resident evil and i wanted that to feel like uh let's say red or not or arma or something like just i wanted it to be grounded and i wanted to have my like really good grounded gunplay but at the same time be able to do something that's like very different from just fighting robbers or criminals or uh, you know a war in like with different soldiers or whatnot it's yeah i must also say that basically everything i've seen from the scp side of this is like again the kind of attention to detail like all of the soldiers designs um the kind of stuff that we want to design together as a team uh, when we talk about guns and uniforms and it's it's also in the same kind of vein even though it's coming from as you say like an scp lore it's like people have wanted from the start in the scp universe to kind of get all of the details right they have the right weapons they have the right stuff uh the kind of tactics that we want seems to fit into that kind of thinking it's not like an illogical word world i guess like the world building is really good and you have uh yeah everything you need to make a believable uh you know, tactical shooter in there. Very important question. Do you like SCP-999? Oh, no. I must admit, I don't know what that is. <laughs> oh, no. It's, it's that sort of... Slimy, very cute, uh, yellow oh, yeah. character. That is very kind. I have seen that, yeah. Is that the tickle monster? Cute and slimy. <laughs> yeah. Well, there we go. Samir knows way more than me. I've. Samir, I've have had a period when I was. Yeah. Have you gotten into SCP? I'm kind of curious to hear your your SCP story. My exposure to it was higher when I was younger because I was, you know, interested in like creepy pastas and stories and all that. And I found that to be very interesting because it, it was so varied and the fact that it was written by multiple people. Uh, every, everyone came up with their own different universes and 
characters and was so varied and expansive that you, you can go hours and hours upon, upon reading. It, it's like if you were a, a, a fan of Harry Potter or a fan of Game of Thrones. I don't know if that makes sense, but... I mean, I wouldn't say I w I'm a fan of SCP, but I am appreciative of of what it is. You're doing a very good job entertaining these people. Uh, Launch Space says, dude, it's 12 p.m. and I haven't eaten breakfast yet because of the stream. I'm so hungry, but I don't want to miss this. Ah! Oh, my God. Was at this. Yeah. Oh, I have a pistol match in, what is it, like seven hours? I should sleep, but fuck it. <laughs> well, keep on animating. Exactly. That's the problem when you've got, like, uh, people from all around the world. <laughs> I'd rather starve than not listen to these guys spit fire, says X Draper. <laughs> oh, wow. It's it's already tough working with the other developers since they're from all over the world as well. So even here having troubles with that, it's not a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you guys are enjoying this. It's uh, our first time, so it's like just uh, talking stuff and doing work, and hopefully it is entertaining to some extent. Well, I think people like to show that, like, work is being go gone, uh, you know, you sign an NDA, so as much as I would love to leak everything and say, oh, look at this cool monster, look at this thing they're working on, you know, they they like to have some sort of surprise, uh, so I think this, like, shows that, uh, you know, stuff stuff is being done, which, you know, uh, you, you feel better when you're waiting for something when you know, uh, like, work is being done on it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I know the feeling. <laughs> So, I guess, uh, how would you describe, it sounds like most of your projects are like working internationally with people from all kinds of time zones, so you're used to it, but how, how would you describe the challenges of working as an animator uh, in this uh, wonderful, multicultural, melting pot of game development? I think it's great, and um, I think the best part is that, as you say, it's actually possible to work with people from other places now. Uh, in Norway, this would not be possible, like... I don't think if you guys have heard of any Norwegian FPS games, or at least like tactical shooters, like, yeah, I... They're all Swedish. Yeah, exactly. I, I probably had to move to Sweden in that case. And yeah, it's just really cool to be able to do exactly this kind of work. Like, it's so, so specific. And when it's specific, it typically means that you don't really get to do uh, that kind of work. Like, that's not possible. What would be your nightmare also, of, like, the worst animation thing that you could ever we'll have? see you there, Bishop. Oh, my God. Look who we have here. A special guest. It is Trey yeah. Bishop, the director of SCP-5K. Lay down the incredible knowledge you have of SCP lore and game development on upon these eager people. <laughs> well, actually, I saw a, a question pop up. I was watching the stream from YouTube, uh, and someone asked uh, if the GOC were going to be part of 5K. So oh, I thought I'd hop in here and uh, yes. maybe give some insight to it. Do it. Yeah. So, the GOC. I will say, we've always planned to have other factions in the game, and I don't think you'll be disappointed, and by that I mean very, very soon. <gasps> yes, sir. <laughs> People like it. <laughs> People are getting hyped. Yep. Oh my god, it's like E3 times a thousand! Yeah! <laughs> now you're happy you all didn't sleep, huh? Better than the Taco Bell Direct. Yeah, actually, um, there's a teaser coming up uh, soon that I'll be posting in the Discord. Uh, um, so keep your eyes peeled over the next couple of days, and uh, it will be giving an announcement about the next update and a devlog that's coming up, and that'll have a lot more information for all of you. Any special questions for Trey? You got him right now. Uh, he's free. Um, if you want your lore questions, this is the time to bomb him, as well as anything about animation. He 
here's a good question. Are you guys considering showing off the game during Summer Game Fest? Um, crud, I should probably look into that. <laughs> <laughs> at the moment, we don't have any plans, but it's not off the table completely. But at the moment, there are no plans. Question, will Ganzir be there? Skip. <laughs> The Omicron asks, very important question. Do you like SCP-999? <laughs> so, okay, I, I got to talk about SCP-999 a little bit with you guys. Um, everybody, who doesn't like the little friendly fella, right? The little yellow plate? But I think, that, you know, it is a horror game what we're making. And Area 12 is specifically a research facility for the SCP Foundation that specializes in uh, doing research uh, biological research about these anomalies and a lot of materials for tools and and uh, um, uh, equipment are synthesized from the research that they've done here using SCP and anomalous materials and because of the nature of what's happening in, the, in our story where the foundation for a mysterious reason has um, sort of turned against humanity um, 999 might be in the game but maybe in not the way you're probably hoping Probably in a more, uh, maybe he's been juiced and turned into something else useful. <laughs> oh no. Ooh, teasers. So we have a very interesting question from HP, not Harry Potter, but HP. You need to add OSHA as a faction. The facilities don't seem very safe. There is a note on a bulletin board somewhere that will be in the game that says, uh, you know, please let a manager know if you see OSHA as soon as you can. <laughs> OSHA is the enemy of this game, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, they're the real enemy. Well, there's so many violations in Area 12, or any any uh, site or facility for the Foundation, really. So this question has been coming up a lot. I've been evasive, but now that I have a person who's uh, better equipped to answer it, Operation Moonfall. What's going on? What's the 411? Mm, you have to wait for the roadmap on that one. It's a little too far along. I, I probably can't give too much information about it, but uh, stuff to do with the moon is still happening. Question, who came up with the new 041, 0451 whiteboard? <laughs> that was uh, that was uh, Reese. Uh, he's one of our 3D artists. <laughs> he he hated our our placeholder like little code thing that was on the on the note for the board. So he he threw that together pretty quickly for us. Uh, do you know the origin behind the zero four five one, Dre? I don't. I think that was probably something that started before I was here. It all came from System Shock. Oh, oh my god! And it's been used since then in multiple video games as a nod. I didn't realize you guys were making a System Shock reference. Holy shit. That makes so much more sense now. Charbros asks, will we see any scientists roaming sections of the facility? Ah. Ah, what a good hmm. question. Um, maybe. I would say it'd be really weird for us to have just put you in this massive facility underground with 90 plus floors and never see another scientist. I'll say that much. How did the UIU manage to get money to afford such good gear? What good gear? You start with a knife. <laughs> It's a really good knife. Yeah. <laughs> it's very it's a good, good knife. knife. Even that was over budget. So one thing that people have been asking about um, is that there's a lot of demand for flamethrowers and mini guns, uh, Gatling guns, rocket launchers. Um, is that within the resources or does that break the tactical immersion to, you know, go all predator? Well, uh, Special guns are definitely a thing, right? When you have a fantastical world like this and there's special equipment from 
well, the Foundation to deal with these anomalous things, you'd think they would have those kinds of special guns and you'd encounter them. Uh, the trick is acknowledging that, but, but not um, creating an imbalance on what's so special about this game, whereas you're going in as a realistic, grounded, tactical unit with normal equipment and going up against things that you, um, you don't really know how to contend with and your gear is not designed for these kinds of things. So when we, if we have a, a case where there are special guns, they're going to be uh, rare and they're going to have very heavy limitations just so that it doesn't become something you can pick up and go through the game and just OP your way through the entire mission. You know, um, And then some things we're also trying to leave open for creating opportunities for modders to come in and, and do their thing, which they, they, don't, they totally will. Is there any plans for pickup tools or weapons that interact with objects? Yes. Another interesting question from Secret Agent Pancake. How's coming up with the lore and stuff? I've always been interested in what you guys could do with the 5,000 story. Um, Sorry, could you repeat that? Um, how's coming up with lore and stuff? I've always been interested about what you guys could do with the 5,000 story. Well, we have a, a really talented team of writers that are heavily entrenched and in, in, in have uh, a lot of background and experience over the years, even before here, uh, creating articles and being involved in the SCP Wiki. Um, and they've, they've helped us write a lot of lore and information and adapt a lot of things. And, you know, we have other writing members on the team as well. And we've, we've gone and consulted with people even outside of our own internal team, people like Tanhoney, who actually did write the 5,000 article. So the how, we, how we've gone about it is um, trying to be faithful and not destroy what was already there and, and respect it and, and honor it, but also find a way to present it in a new way um, without breaking anything. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but I, if you have any more, feel free to ask. Lear asks, any plans for the micro HID uh, making an appearance, even as an Easter egg, or would that be too fan servicey? Mm. Mm. I'll think about it. <laughs> but no. Yeah, I do want to like get the writers in like some sort of event. Uh, I have to go into their writing cave and uh, you know bring them out on stream. Uh, you you will hear from them in some capacity in the future, so uh, look out for that and look forward to it since uh, they are very experienced SCP writers. Charbros asks to reference a prior question from someone else. Will cutscenes be added? Point of contention for many cutscenes. Our goal is to make sure that we're not disrupting the the immersion and the experience of playing the game. Um, but there are some moments where we will need a cutscene, but we will try to avoid using them or overusing them as much as possible. Uh, we, we want things to feel like they're happening as you're playing, rather than ripping control away from the players. Um, but I think the most likely scenario, if you see a cutscene, it would be towards the the beginning or the very end of a mission where you're you've completed your task anyway. So uh, I take it. Yes, uh, I see live cutscenes. Yeah, there there will be some sort of live like while you're playing cutscene type things happening as well as uh, sequences, I guess. So we're looking forward to um, uh, quick time events, uh, you know, being added. Quick time events? Is that the question? <laughs> it, it, was just, it was just me joshing you. Uh, you know, the, nobody likes quick time events. Oh, yeah. No, we're... No, nobody does. Um, quick time events, I, I will definitely answer that one clearly. Fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> the, the gauntlet has been thrown. Watch out, Shenmue and God of War. <laughs> uh, 
so one kind of question that's recurred uh, throughout the stream a lot is uh, tools. What are the sort of plans for like adding tools since uh, as of right now there aren't a lot and like what kind of gameplay functionality uh, will be sort of lights or other kind of gadgets? Um, I don't want to cover too many of them, um, but they'll be coming into play and being made known very soon. We've been working on and prototyping a lot of things. Um, one thing I'll tease a little bit, which is it should be already known from playing the most recent update, is that uh, SCP crates, like container boxes for um, moving and transporting anomalies, um, those need to be open somehow, so it's pretty common that you might find a crowbar, for example, in the game. Um, and maybe you might be able to open a crate for some reason or another to get information or to find something. And maybe it's not an SCP crate, but if you can pick up a crowbar for that, it might serve another purpose. The facility is in a containment breach for some reason that I won't disclose yet, but the, uh, the crowbar might come in handy for prying open other things to give you access to new areas as well. So here's the most important question of the stream for all three of you. You have to uh, think very long and hard on this answer, answer. What is your favorite drink from the automat? Dr. Beppis, conch, or radioactive? Oh, banana Beppis. Conk. What about you? Conk gang. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're Dr. Redacted. Guy. Dr. Redacted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh, here's a really good lore question. When I started playing, the initial beginning room with the whiteboard says, do not talk to the voices, try not to negotiate with the voices. Were they referencing a specific SCP or was that random? Not gonna and it, not gonna lie, I think it should be expanded on. I think at the time it was something that was random, um, but um, it's definitely something we can expand on that would fit in with a couple of other things that are happening. And I, and I don't want to steal the, the show here, by the way, because this is a, a stream for Anders and the animation and, and everything, but I, I'm glad I was able to answer some questions. Um, no, this is awesome. Uh, we've only been talking about the guns in an SP game, which is <laughs> one side of a very big... Uh, well, I mean, but they're, 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 they're one side, but they're a big side, right? Um, I don't know if anyone can tell from just watching Anders here just how, <laughs> how much detail and complexity is going on uh, in, going into these animations for these guns. I, I know we get a lot of praise for the, the quality and considerations that we take with these animations, and a lot of that largely is in part thanks to, to, to people like Anders um, and Caden, who, who models these fantastic things that he's animating. Um, these, these guys are phenomenal. Um, they, they consider everything about, like, how it how it's used, where it's going to get wear on it, and and what it might weigh, depending on the materials that it's made with, because you have different kinds of stocks. You have some that are made of wood, some are aluminum, some are composite, and they they think of all this stuff. It's just incredible. And I I will, I've watched them for hours sit there and do the same animation, and tweak it and fine tune it for for hours and hours just trying to get it right, and it really makes a difference. I appreciate that, and it's exactly as you say, just. It comes down to if we do that with every aspect of the game, it turns into this really cool, passionate thing rather than just like a product. And and hopefully that's what you guys see as well when you watch us work here. It's just it's really fun for us. Yeah. Yeah, we all try our best, which is really good. Yeah. yeah. But you guys aren't just animating guns though either. You guys are animating um, characters, uh, props. You guys are animating creatures now for the game because we're we're really getting a, a bigger influx of creatures uh, starting. Well, we've already started, but there's even more coming. Um, and you guys have been really kicking oh. kicking some ass on that. Yeah, absolutely. And and like I said, there's a lot of stuff that comes into like motion capture and creatures uh, that we can't talk much about yet, of course. But it's gonna be, you know, continuous effort at this point. Uh, hopefully, showing that. Like all of these aspects, not only the guns is gonna be, uh, you know, really worked on. Yeah, I'm excited for that. Honestly, like thinking about the stuff that we can't show yet, but I know that uh, it's gonna come out soon. It's very cool. <laughs> it's so hard. Like, you, you, I, I want to show everyone all the cool stuff that you guys are making, and I want to talk about it, but I'm trying to, trying to restrain myself a little bit. 
Well, here's a little good yeah, compromise question <laughs> that won't spoil anything. Do you prefer making first person animations or outside animations, creature, peoples, etc.? I think both have their uh, interesting like perks because when you're working with something very big like a creature or uh, a human doing like a uh, motion capture kind of thing, you're seeing it more at this kind of distance uh, where you don't really see that much detail in the fingers or very specific things, but you need to get all of the big motions uh, very correct. Um, and that's where you kind of get into a place where, uh, again, when you're getting really, really good at this, you can do all of them. And you can basically see that um, they're more or less the same thing, but with attention to different kinds of details. Um, and the closer you get, the more like small, subtle shakes to the gun, for example, has to be done. Um, the closer I get, I see there is like a very smooth robotic feel to the gun that's going to go away uh, later in the process. And that process is not really done when you do motion capture, for example. It's not like you go in and look at like the pinky finger like this and then try to move that like a little bit. That's not really uh, the way that works. So, so yeah, definitely like I like both. Um, I have more uh, like experience with just doing guns and then therefore just doing fingers and hands. Uh, and small details, but then in the future, uh, hopefully I can say that, yeah, it's going to be uh, more or less the same thing and just different uh, ways of working, really. Here's an interesting question. Is your current priority new content or bug fixing? Yeah. So, um, obviously, the answer is yes. <laughs> Both. Um, so, with the the incredible work that everybody has been doing on this team, it has also just been a very small team for a long time, and it's a very big project. Uh, it's an ambitious one, and even though we've we have a specific scope and a story and a plan and a roadmap now, um, there's still there were still some hurdles to overcome, and being able to to keep up the pace of putting out updates but also being able to handle and, and fix the bugs with the limited people we had has been a real challenge so for example i don't know how many people you guys think that we've had programming this game this whole time but it has been one maybe two people at any given point in time programming everything and one of those programmers is also the technical director um and that's a lot of that's a lot of bandwidth to try to to spread yourself out over um and making new things, but also checking bugs. But we have recently uh, done a lot of expansion on the team, and we have a much more robust programming team now. And we've got spe uh, specific people uh, focused on UI, on AI development, and um, gameplay stuff. So creating systems that we need to try to finish getting all the things implemented that we wanted, but also allow us to work together with this larger team to, to sort of address these bugs. Um, and then recently, with the last update, we made a, a concerted effort to try to involve the community, the, the backers, in uh, playtesting. And that was, that was invaluable. Uh, and we started putting in systems to allow us to track uh, where players are spending the most time or where they're not in the levels. So we can see what's interesting to them, what's not, um, where they get stuck, and we can collect all that data. And that's, that's helping us tremendously. So we are, we are focused on both. They're both a priority. So here's a really uh, increasingly more, more so our capacity to handle those things is has improved. So here's a great question for all three of you, not related, but would you rather work one week as a D class or one year as a facility guard? <laughs> Depends uh, pre or post uh, Omnicide. Anders, what about you and Samir? Uh, what would you yeah, prefer? Yeah, basically, same as the, as the, like you, it, it depends on what kind of job you would be doing, right? Like, uh, obviously, the guards are having a shitty time when the players come in and start cleaning up. But yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, D class is also there's different classifications. So which D class are we? A, are we a red man? Uh, are we are we orange? Are we blue? You know. 
Yeah, more grunt work or science. Yeah, it depends. I would say I would probably prefer to be a guard because I actually have a means to defend myself. So Nothing a little Kaden five five six can do. Yeah. So Caden wants to be able to bully the lesser people and, and be mean to D class. That's what I heard. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there was also, ooh, this is a good question. Uh, what about death animations like getting stabbed by the surgeon crabs or other horrific things? Um, are there plans for those or do you like animating them? Uh, I missed the final part of the question there. Could you repeat? Uh, do you like animating death animations? And are there plans for like unique de death animations for like, uh, cra you know, the crabs or uh, other uh, monstrosities inhabiting Area 12? Ah, oh, okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, it's, um, again, like, when it comes to anything that's third person for the humans, typically that would be done in uh, mocap, right? Like, you do motion capture uh, recordings where you're trying to get as many of those specific instances as you can, um, where typically you end up with very many animations if you try to do one for each, like, instance. So, yeah, um, death animations is certainly something that I enjoy working on when I... Uh, when I do, um, and it all depends on like specific instances, like the crab or getting blown up or shot in a specific way or torn to shreds by something. It's like yeah, it's it, it, it all depends. Like it's um, in some cases um, you would partially become a ragdoll, I guess, depending on what happens, and in others you would become like somewhere in between. And then yeah, it, it again, it's all very much like a question for uh, what kind of instance we're talking about. And then in general, I would say, yes, absolutely. Right. Like, yeah, we want to have that and we want to have uh, as many custom things as possible. Right. Like that's just going to look nice, but at the same time, it takes time, it takes money. Um, there are two questions that popped up while you were talking that I actually want to target specifically, if you don't mind, Isaac. Go ahead. Uh, feel free, if you, especially if any you know okay. anything uh, strikes your. Uh, I am just uh, facilitating, facilitating the conversation, keeping things uh, removing dead air. But if you want to respond, uh, go for it. Cool. Uh, the first question of the two I saw was from Kextreme, K Extreme. Uh, sorry if I butchered your username. Is there any work being done on adjusting the final part of Area Twelve, the final run? away from the explosion part. It feels a lot like a bullet sponge, and I feel like you often run out of ammo consistently at that part. So, to address this thing. The blowing up the reactor and running out of the facility and hitting an elevator and everything, that is that is both, one, not going to stay in the game, two, not the end of Area 12. Not by a, not by a long shot. Um, so, I wouldn't be too worried about that, but in, in general, we will be... Make, we've been making hard considerations on how to balance uh, ammunition availability across the board. Um, the other question I saw was, are there any plans for starting outside and entering a facility, kind of like what we had in our cinematic trailer? Well, I believe in never showing off something that you never intend to actually have in your game. Um, there is a plan. You, you won't start in Area 12. And I'll leave it at that. Mind blown. Da -da -da. So. Very nice. Would you like to add environmental hazards such as like half-life barnacles, like creatures or spores, etc.? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, we've had stuff that we've already been working on for, for that.
So, uh, just out of curiosity, when you're animating a creature, do you where do you what's the starting point? Like, obviously, you can't motion capture a monstrosity that doesn't exist. Is it just sort of finding like real life inspiration? What is the starting point in bringing motion to the unknown? <laughs> Yeah, no, the reason why Trey is laughing is because that's exactly it. You make um, your own reference most of the time, like, unless you can find a creature that's, like, well-behaved and mannered enough to do exactly what you want. Uh, yeah, we have had Trey do stuff on the floor for me uh, or other animators in the team. Yeah, and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> just yesterday, I was walking around on my webcam, in front of my webcam uh, in my desk space, like a chicken. Uh, so that was fun. <laughs> So that happened. <laughs> I won't say why. You can make your own assumptions. Yes. So uh, there's a reason why Andy Circus is, uh, you know, the top game in the town. <laughs> it's because he walks around like a chicken. Yeah. Professionally. Um, someone said there were something about the player counts being low and if we're going to have a new update in quarter one yes we're absolutely going to have an update in quarter one I, I said this earlier this person may not have been on here when i said it but there will be an announcement on our discord community here in the next couple of days announcing both the update um launch day and also giving um information about the upcoming devlog where we'll talk more about it So is there any possibility about uh, adding a riot shield uh, from a gameplay standpoint? Um, would that or would that break the game? And uh, what would uh, what goes into uh, animating something like a riot shield as they've kind of become more popular? That sounds like a two parter. I'll answer the first part. And I'll, let answer, I'll let Andrews answer the second. Um, we would like to. It would be an interesting and fun game mechanic. Um, but it'll come down to, once we get the things that are within scope, determining if we have the extra bandwidth to afford adding something like that in. Um, but if we do, Anders, how would we approach that? Yeah, no, I mean, I agree, and it's basically like any other kind of reference-based thing where I would probably just have us gather a bunch of reference of a guy walking around with a shield, look at other games, of course, um, Modern Warfare 2, the 2008 one comes to mind, like where I remember very vividly like where you had guns, you had hitting with a shield, you had different things happening, um, depending on like if you got flashbanged or something, and you had sort of like a stunned animation. There's so many things that you can do there, um, but it comes down to really just uh, making it work in game, uh, adding interesting, uh, you know, things because obviously it's just like a big thing in front of your face, so you would need to make the hands kind of move in an interesting way and maybe have some finger, uh, you know jitters and stuff like try to make it look interesting in uh, different ways and then finally you would also make this uh very difficultly i think or like very uh, hard thing to do right when you go into doing it in third person and trying to figure out how does this actually work when you have all of the animations because you're gonna have uh you know uh, separate like walking cycles and you probably need to be crouched so you need to figure that out yeah it's a whole thing, but it's definitely a good idea to go and look at other, uh, you know, how how did they do it in Modern Warfare? How did they do it in Rainbow Six Siege, for example? Is that good or bad? Is that exactly what we want to do? Yeah, so there are many ways to do that. There hasn't been a specific question about this, but I see enough people referencing it and commenting on uh, what alludes to this idea, which is uh, how many players are actively participating in the game day to day. The player count, um, the different game modes, PvP, all those things. Um, I want everyone that's that's watching and listening to rest assured that we haven't forgotten about those things. And there are things that we've been working on for the different game modes that you'll like. Um, and we have been putting a lot of thought and attention into things like PvP and Wave Survival. But they'll be coming soonish. Axo on the YouTube stream asks, will you be adding SCP-323? SCP-32... 32 what? Uh, 
Probably not. Um, we've we've kind of tried to. Um, we're not trying to do the thing where we're like, oh, everybody listens to this band, so we're not gonna listen to it just out of spite. But like, we we are trying to avoid doing too many of the more popular ones purely because we want to give some love and attention to some that are less frequently used or, or less common. Um, and I'm I'm not sure that it plays a big enough role in what we want to do with the story here. Um, but who knows? There's always DLC stuff, and maybe that's something that a modder could add in. So, here's a wild question. What would be your dream SCP that you'd love to add, but, you know, can't do to logistics or gameplay implementation reasons? Just common sense okay, stops you. But can't do logistically. Ooh. Well, I found ways to, uh, to, to squeeze things in that I that I did want, uh, actually, despite the logistical uh, <laughs> complications. So that's hard to answer because if if I if I tell the truth, then what I'm really going to do is end up telling you what will be in the game. Um. Mm, I'm not sure how to answer. Yeah, actually, you know what? I can give you an answer. Um. Uh, one second. Um. Let me make sure that I'm not misspeaking here. Yeah. If there was a if there was an SCP that I would love to put in the game, I would love to put SCP seven seven six nine. X Dreeper asks, will SCP-6448 be possible to, uh, to be added, or um, is that not on the list? Mm. Every time someone asks about whether an SCP will be in the game, I always have to sit here and think, should I, should I give a confirmation, or should I not? Uh, I'm going to say no. And a far more easier question to ask. Charbros asks, when will the shotgun by the elevator in Chapter 2 be available for pickup? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Never, uh, yeah. <laughs> we just put it there to antagonize you. No, um, probably soon. Um, there's also an idea for having um, a modified version of a shotgun, which should be exciting to some people. Uh, there's a... Let's see. How how about external operations like going into cities and rescuing civilian survivors or missing UIU teams or any other types of operations other than raids on facilities? Well, you are in luck. We, we have a plan for doing other locations and those plans are underway. So, Trey, what's your SCP origin story? How did you get um, involved? Uh, you know, how did you first encounter SCP? Oh, man, I'm, I'm, I was around, like, at the beginning of SCP, uh, whenever I was in school as a, as a teenager. Um, I'm, just so you know how old I am, uh, I'm old enough that I had to put the TV on Channel 3 to play video games. Uh, that's how old I am. Um... <laughs> The, uh, I think when the SCP first stuff first came out, like the original one, 173 was the first thing. Um, and I really got into Containment Breach when it, when it was made, the original one, and, and I loved it. Uh, it was amazing. It was so different at the time. It was just this whole entirely new universe. I mean, it was, it was using a lot of ideas from other existing things in, in pop culture and referencing different, um, uh, scenarios, but it was still presenting it in a way that was different and, and exciting um, in a video game kind of setting. Um, I would say that that's probably the first exposure I had to it was just the beginning of it all. <laughs> the, 
This is more of a compliment, but I thought I'd highlight it. Also, give the person that designed the D-Class a raise as well. So much potential with that. Could be cool be adding moral choices, such as whether to be put a dirt, burning D-Class out of its misery, etc. Adds to the aesthetic of the environment. We'll have to pass that on to Kyle Fitzpatrick. Um, there was a lot of people that helped contribute to the to the overall execution of that and, and like some other smaller ideas, but that's largely thanks to Kyle Fitzpatrick, our art director, who is the, the mastermind behind the idea of the D-Class suit and what made it so iconic and, and interesting. Um, but we'll, we will definitely let him know. Thank you. Well, uh, there's also I, I I mean this isn't a secret, but yeah, that design is actually available in the real life, and you 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 are the uh, the person who uh, wields or has access to that, right? Right. I do have a, a physical, real D class suit that's just it's like the one in the game. The zippers work, the straps buckle, everything. Um, it's surprisingly comfortable. Um, I haven't slept in it, but I'm I've been tempted to. Oh really? Uh, does it muffle your voice when you like? Uh, can you talk through it, or can you not, like not hear it? No, I think it's fine. Uh, the the hood is um, it's a mesh that you can see through from the inside, but you can't really see through from the outside, and it's it's quite breathable, and I don't think it really hinders um, my ability to vocalize at all. Launch Space asks, question for Anders, as someone that animates for games, has doing animation or VFX for movies, either live action or animated, been an interest to you or a goal? Uh, sorry, I missed the last part of the question. Um, basically, a goal, yeah. No, it was... Yeah, no, definitely. For me, it was actually starting with video games directly, where it was, you know, looking at games I liked and seeing that, wow, these animations are exactly what I want to make. Uh, how can I do that? And that was like the whole start of the journey. And then it has, of course, expanded into uh, understanding more about what exactly goes into like, okay, we want to make something realistic, but at the same time, you need to have some sort of exaggeration and follow the principles of animation, which is uh, more often than not, it's more about just you understand them as like rules and then you see them in context and it's yeah it, it, it just makes a lot of sense when, when you start animating and then you start learning those principles which is typically like okay when something moves it should move more or less in a circle because otherwise it's going to look very stiff and robotic it has to have travel through so when you move something to the right for example it should go uh you know beyond and then back a little bit and have some uh jiggles uh, so the stuff where you can sort of use that on guns and then realize that you can use it on everything. It's a, it's a very fun uh, like experience just to see that I may be able to get, uh, you know, decent at other types of animation than only like gun animation. Yeah. And watching you guys sort of master your craft with all this animation stuff, it's the tricky part from, from, my, from the outside watching in is you guys having to understand all those things you just talked about, observing them, and, and knowing what those rules are, but then having to know when to break those rules because uh, sometimes making it look correct is more about making it feel correct so that it looks right. Because if you make it exactly right, sometimes it doesn't feel correct, right? Exactly. Very, very uh, true. Yeah, and, and most often not like if you search for, for example, the Modern Warfare animations and then look up people trying to do them on like airsoft guns in real life, very often you end up liking the animation more than the real thing because it just it doesn't move the right way it feels stiff it doesn't do like you say the intention of what we would want and when we start doing animations on creatures it's the same thing like yeah this moves exactly like a crab or a spider and it's like okay well that doesn't matter it doesn't look right it doesn't feel the way that we need it to feel uh, so that's exactly it when all of the other uh, like abstract i guess <laughs> things comes in and just you have to uh, go with what looks right and it's sort of difficult to put words on it yeah uh edm smash says say hi to anders from uh pablo stinos he knows me oh my god yes he was originally a part of the ismc team um amazing guy from egypt we 
basically me, uh, Pablo Stinos, and Tempter. I think we got together first, just like, hey, should we try to do something? Uh, Tempter, John, he was the only guy that actually had any experience at all, like doing anything in 3D. So he had to teach us, and um, yeah, <laughs> so he was there throughout the whole ICNC days. Like, uh, it was amazing. So he's a good friend and good guy. Uh, Trey, when you were, you know, doing your Nick Fury thing, assembling your Avengers of SCP tactical combat, how did you recruit Anders and Samir? How did you find them out in the wild world of the web? <laughs> uh, well, that's a bit more complicated of an answer because technically I didn't really recruit them. Um, I wasn't the director of the game from the beginning. Um, I don't think we even had one to start with. Is that is that right, Anders and Samir? Yeah, exactly. And uh, honestly, like when me and Samir got in, it was uh, via uh, OHD. Like we had some mutual developers just like, hey, we want to make this game. Uh, and we see that you guys like guns. We like guns too. Do you want to come and work with us? <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. So it was a very different uh, time where it was more just like, hey, let's make, you know, this gun. And then let's make the next one. And that was like the first year or so for us. Yeah, I I didn't actually take on take on the uh, the director position here until around July, and it was a very transitionary period while um, we tried to actually organize and structure everything and and start building up our teams and figuring out what the the scope of the project was going to be and where we were going to take it and how we were going to execute on all these things. Um, and so the the update that we did in uh, it was November uh, was actually like uh, when that when that came out that was the first like little bit of influence from us changing things up and building the teams and, and going in a different direction um, and then now this next update that's coming up is going to be like full force um, my influence over the project uh, so I we're, we're now operating full steam ahead with me in this position um, but assembling team members is really a collective effort. The, the leads go and look for the people that they think are right. We rely on them quite a bit for um, finding what they think is the right fit for the project based on what we need and how their communication style works. Um, the producers also find people. I, I have found people and brought them to the team. Um, but it's really a collective effort to make sure that we're all coming together and communicating with each other on on who is being uh, a part of this and how they're contributing in a meaningful way that's that's on the same uh, wavelength of, as us, that they share the same vision that we have and the, the enthusiasm. When did 5K start development? That is a good question, because like uh, I know when did you do, yeah. when did you guys do the Kickstarter? Like in uh, two thousand twenty two, or was it earlier? Uh, I think the Kickstarter um, occurred right at the end of twenty twenty one, and in you know it was met with success, and they it went into full swing uh, production wise as far as really like having people focusing on the game uh, full time. Uh, the beginning of twenty twenty two. Which, as it so happens, is around the time that I showed up um, under a different role. And, well, then July of this past year, my role changed, of course. Um, so, but I, I think they were working on the game. You guys, Caden, I'm, I'm not sure, you've probably been here longer than me. You guys were working on the game at least two years before the Kickstarter wrapped up, right? Mm, not that long. No. Well, it's been a while, so that's and that's why I say there's two answers. There's there's when it started off with like the group of people that kind of came together and said, "Hey, let's make a game," and it kind of grew and grew, and then it kind of um, um, was manifested into existence by by all these talented people that put the put a lot of hard work and time into it. And um, I think. Secretly, in my mind, I, I feel like we've we've only really started like making some serious progress with the game uh, this year, or not this year, but I guess this last year. Um, so it depends. Like if if you're talking about the project as a whole, like all the prototyping and the, the ideation and and the, the 
the pre-production to develop and uh, the ideas and, and create the, the framework for everything. It's been a few, a few years. Um, but as far as SCP 5k, the game as it is now in the direction it's going, I would say we've been working on it for about the past eight months. So, uh, interesting question. Love the animation you guys made for the crabs. Will the leg system be used for other SCPs in the future? Is there any way to kind of utilize? And uh, just to add to that, um, uh, how did you develop the uh, walking system for the crabs? So that was all Albarni doing, like, the procedural system for the legs. And then the actual animations was uh, made by uh, our animator, Gabriel. Uh, he is amazing at creatures and... He also did, in fact, make the um, animations for the resonator, like the the dog. Um, so yeah, I think it was a collaborative effort between those two. Where, again, you come with stuff like a very nice keyframe animation for the crab, and trying to also make it work in different scenarios. So you could, for example, have different attacks, but it's still like using its legs to climb on a wall or something, and you could kind of combine those two with procedural systems, which again means like the programmer comes in and sort of sets up a system for the legs to to override or add on uh, different things so that's pretty much it yeah um and yeah that would certainly be a good idea to do on other recipes uh, where that's kind of like same workflow and kind of same style of let's make it work in the environment and not just look great because if you do one or the other you're just gonna get a really functioning thing or you're just gonna get a very nice looking thing but not really interacting with the environment so yeah definitely here's an interesting question um are you guys considering alternative attacking methods for the scps for an example the crabs being able to lunge at you and uh, hypothetically, if you are like, how how difficult would it be to implement that? I mean, that sounds really cool, but uh, I don't know how uh, that works from a logistics standpoint. I'll let you answer this one, Trey. <laughs> you want me to answer it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it is really important to us that our enemies, like the way they are in the game right now, it probably doesn't seem like there's a lot of variety to their behavior, and that's true. But it is important to us that they do have variety and that they're each individually distinct from each other um, and they behave in their own unique ways and attack in very specific uh, ways with some variety depending on circumstances so kind of I agree yeah the crabs will probably have at least at least three different ways of doing damage to you I could put it that way one might be a real surprise. So is there a plan to redesign Peanut's AI? He is too predictable at the moment in time and fear factor gets lost. Like instead of a linear approach, you look away and he chooses an alternate attack route where you might not expect. Actually, we had to talk about this not too long ago um, to make sure that the player isn't forced once they get into a line of sight with 173, that you're not just perpetually trapped with uh, this, this uh, this gaze lock where you have to walk backwards backwards from that point on to be able to get away from them and get through the space we would like to make it so that if you lose sight of them that it won't always necessarily just get closer and closer until it gets back into the line of sight with you but that it can lose you but it's intelligent enough to go and try to find an alternate route that you're not expecting to come from so that you don't have to always walk backwards so improvements of the AI yes Another question, will any other SCPs have unique weaknesses like the crabs do when they flee when taking damage? Although that seems more like a behavior than a weakness, but uh, that, that is an interesting question. Of course. Um, 
if you've noticed, if you shoot at the crabs on the top side, um, their shells are kind of impenetrable. They're a lot softer on the belly. Um, so animation-wise, there are some things being done to give you opportunities to have um, a shot at that, that, that sort of more vulnerable side of the crab. And that's something that we'll, we'll continue to look for in most of our enemies, is um, having, having unique weaknesses of some kind, or, or um, communicating what they're invulnerable to uh, in some capacity. Or we could just do a Dark Souls thing, and just every single SCP to deal with it, you just run around behind it and hit it in the butt. Yeah, well, when we get in uh, dodge roll added to 5k. <laughs> Um, right after we get barrel rolls, I want to be able to zoom around and just spin in the air. That's what I want. That that would be an amazing, like, April Fool's Day joke. Like, you just log into the game and suddenly there's, like, a stamina meter and then you can just, like, roll out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Or we could change the animation from, from running to skipping. Like, you just kind of frolic through the, through the map. It'd be fun. How would you go about uh, creating a skipping animation in first person? Is is that possible? Hmm. Skipping as in, like, uh, jumping very short, you mean? Or yeah, I'm not sure. Like a, like a frolicking kind of run. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, it's all coming down to the hands at that point, right? Like, you have... Uh, in many games, it's very typical that they try to create personality by just looking at fingers and hands in first person. And then if you're lucky, you will have something like the, the third person animations playing on your feet. Uh, and you'll be able to see those feet in first person if you look down. So, yeah, it, it would probably be something like you start with um, a motion capture and then you try to replicate the feeling. Again, going back to what you said, Trey, about like it's not really about capturing something uh, you know, specific. It's like a feeling or uh, something abstract in that that you're trying them to replicate, and it can turn very weird and very strange. But then you know that didn't work, and then you try something else, and then yeah, you end up with something. Yeah. Is there plans to replace zombies with an SCP? It has the same sort of aspects as the zombies because I feel the zombies almost don't fit. Uh, yes, uh, zombies have been a placeholder. They've been a great thing to to use to test out um, an AI system for an enemy behavior that can be then applied to a bunch of different enemies that were planned for future stuff, um, and modifying that code base to to sort of uh, fit the behaviors of those individuals uh, respectively. Um, the, the zombies are getting phased out pretty, pretty quickly. Um, we have everything modeled and textured and rigged, and now we're just finalizing prototype behaviors and sort of preparing the spaces for these guys. Because it's also um, some of the things you guys have commented on, like the behavior of 173, for example. Sometimes the thing that makes a difference on whether these uh, the behaviors or the animations are, are um, executed well is dependent on the environments that they're in, because the pathfinding works better or worse for certain behaviors, depending on if it's a, a big open space or if it's a closed space with lots of, lots of uh, narrow paths and corners. Um, so that's another big part of like sort of removing all the placeholder stuff and actually putting in the, the permanent planned uh, pathing of, of Area 12 in Act 1 from beginning to end so that not only can we know what spaces we need to put the, the right enemies in um, and balance it properly, but also so that we can get into um, other areas as well, like Act 2, where we'll see things like what's probably replacing the zombies. Um, is it a permanent phase out or will the zombies stay as remnants of some scenes? We will not just throw them away. They will still be present. Uh, it'd be more like you might go into a lab later down the road and there's a zombie cadaver laying on a table. Um, 
motionless and it might get up and then attack you or it might be trapped in a, a freezer room or, or in a random space uh, in the water treatment who, who knows but they will definitely still exist they just won't be uh, a primary enemy anymore so here's a question to you wonderful animators what is your feeling on the philosophy of um, looking down and seeing your feet as in first person mode are, are you pro anti it do you hate it do you love it do you think it adds immersion do you think it's stupid what do you think <laughs> I mean, I like it. It's um, giving you that extra sensation. Like I said, if you have already kind of connected the body and the arms with first-person animations and mocap, like, sure, you just show off the kind of work together. Um, uh, the only problem that I see with it is that depending on how you look down, um, in our game, it's the same kind of problem where either you need to make the character kind of crouch down so he's sort of like slouching over using his pelvis to to get lower when it looks down or you're gonna end up with something like your shoulders and your arms are starting to look very dislocated because you're sort of pushing away from yourself by looking down typically it's like a, a very strange um feeling of um uh, illusion basically like it's it looks fine when you look straight ahead and the more you look down it starts to become this kind of weird feeling that your body is stretching up and your shoulders are getting away from you and it's just very strange so if it's done right yeah absolutely it certainly is not something that you could do for um free look i think like just to get that that out there it's just it depends on how you set it up uh and if you want to go the whole way, well, then you need to do true first person, which is a whole different kind of worms. Very, very difficult to do. And yeah, it looks different. There are two questions I'd like to point out that came across on YouTube and on Discord. Uh, one is, have you played the original 087B and any plans on adding more horror elements such as alarms, random gunshot sounds, ambience, and perhaps someone talking to you or SCP-970? Uh, type events. Um, I'll answer this loosely, but there's absolutely every intention of adding more things. We've already started to do this uh, in the previous update, um, but it will become more and more um, prominent as we go, having those horror elements and the, the sequenced uh, things happening around you to make the space feel like it's alive and things are there, things are occurring as you're traveling through this facility. Gunshots in the distance, uh, people screaming, um, uh, parts of the facility shaking and crumbling and then you don't really know why but something is going down on deeper below and you're getting closer and closer to that that uh, that origin point of the chaos um, and on the on the other question on discord it was are you guys planning on making the humans with guns smarter the guards in the D class as in using cover when available and pushing in squads yes AI programming improvement for both creatures and human enemies has been a, a huge, huge push in the background. Um, so, absolutely. Also, a special thank you for Serpent for the five Gifted Affray memberships and the uh, Mr. Dream that is very generous. Since uh, As of right now, the uh, membership page was, n I don't think it's been set up with any perks or badges, but I will look into that. I was not expecting that to happen, but uh, <laughs> thank you for uh, your wonderful contributions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Someone asked if uh, 7566 is planned for 0 0.14, or does it need more time in the oven? Mm. Listen, in December, we put out a teaser saying that uh, SCP-7566 was coming, and uh, it would be in 2024. I don't, I don't intend to let you down. <laughs> 914. Uh, 
<laughs> I, I think I talked to somebody about putting it in, a, in like a surplus storage room at some point with like a tarp over it where like part of it's peeled back and you can kind of see it sitting there. <laughs> so here's a question. Uh, I mean, uh, you guys are obviously enjoying the indie life, being on your own, contributing to a team doing all that good stuff but uh if disney or i guess um you know activision came to offer you dream deals for either working at disney or moder or you know uh call of duty which one would you choose i'm gonna go first yeah do it <laughs> i'm gonna choose indie 100 percent Oh man! <laughs> things, things, <laughs> things, yeah, I would say not to both. <laughs> things have been way too chaotic with what's been happening with, um, with you know, things around layoffs and etc. The, the state of games are releasing today. The problems of microtransactions. We all know that. Yeah. And and I think indie is a consistently less worse industry, and it's it actually could be better than AAA in the future. Uh, you know, depending on how things go, just, there's just this sort of hunt for making bigger and bigger and bigger profits. That at the end, what's left with the product? Nothing. There's only so much you can do with Call of Duty. There's only so much you can do with Battlefield, etc. There's certain fatigue that comes with video games. I think lots of people are wondering themselves now. Have I grown old, or are video games worse than they both than than they were before? And depending on how you see things, you could either answer one or the other. So. No, I couldn't agree more. And the more we see, uh, like how the AAA industry treats its workers and the stories we hear, uh, it's just it seems like a place where yeah, you could probably have a decent time if you're lucky for a brief amount of time and then you get laid off or there is no like particular uh, i don't think they keep people around the way that we are doing here in the in the scene right like i wouldn't be uh i wouldn't be allowed to learn as much as i do i probably wouldn't be allowed to um stick around and like grow into a role as much as i do so it's just so many reasons not to do it um it just sounds like a very scary kind of, uh, I wouldn't say like just uh, like bleak future, but it's it's very close to being, um, yeah, like the opposite of what I want to do. Like it just, it's not that kind of uh, growing passionate environment as far as I've seen and as far as I've heard. So yeah, I agree with uh, Samir there. Yeah, I don't think there's really much I can add to that. <laughs> <laughs> there's a question there's a question though that popped up um, that's talking and expanding more on what's going on with the industry as a whole and it says uh, speaking of the AAA industry right now what are your thoughts on the influx of AI into the industry like will it force artists and creators completely out or is this just a temporary panic and let me tell you that that is affecting the games industry it is affecting the animation industry it is affecting film um, I, I have friends that work in, in all these other places and, and they're seeing it everywhere. Um, and I think to answer your question, it's going, it, it already is, but it's going to continue to negatively impact a lot of people and a lot of jobs and a lot of studios in a tremendous way for a time, for sure. Um, and it is scary and it sucks, but it is also something that is not really sustainable and it will, it will kind of cave in on itself in time because it's not the kind of thing that is going to continue to work the way that people think it's going to um the people that are in favor of it um there are there are uses for things like ai tools and plugins we've been using ai tools and plugins forever all of us have anytime we used um a blur filter on an instagram app or or on, on photoshop that's that's technically an ai plugin but um the way that they're sort of building these systems that generate imagery imagery and video and music um eventually once it pushes out too many people it will just have nothing else to to um 
mirror, so it'll just be regurgitating its own stuff, and it will eventually stagnate. Uh, and that's why I say it's not really a sustainable option for everything being solely AI generated. Um, so it, it will be, uh, it will be rough um, for a lot of people, but I don't think it's going to destroy everything completely in the long run. So I hope that I hope that answers your question and gives you a little bit of peace of mind. HP asks, expanding on what Sandy asks, when will cosmetics come to the game and how wide will it be? Hmm. I think this is a me question. I'll just throw Caden under the bus. Caden, you answer it. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know. <laughs> cosmetics, yeah. that's it's, it's very vague. There isn't really an answer to it. Yeah. Are you talking about um, gun equipment? Uh, are you talking about player models what you talking about cosmetics how my guess is like gun skins and possibly player models that's the sense i got um is what they were uh, kind of asking or at least uh that, that's what i've been seeing um you know throughout the uh, stream that seems like they're talking about the omni edition oh like um it says there's gonna be cosmetics coming for omni edition yeah. yes of course all the things that we've um said we're coming with the Omni Edition, those are still coming. Um, it's just a matter of us getting those things completed for the full release of the game. Um, and then, um, yeah. <laughs> I shall create the greatest main flamethrower that mankind has ever seen. Please do, X XD Reaper. I want a flamethrower. We're going to need it soon in the coming update. Are there any plans for an OSD to enhance certain parts of the mission, not for the entire mission, but to help create more of a ah for scenes? Because there is a, like a lot of really cool music in uh, 5K. Uh, yeah. So yes, the a lot of things that we've been removing and putting in the, like the the real finished stuff in in lieu of the placeholder content uh, means also putting in more of the music, putting in more. Um, dynamic uh, hero set pieces that are like the real things that like draw your eye and create a, a dramatic uh, presentation for everything the lighting staging all that properly um, and then setting up sequencing for for when human enemies or monster enemies come in um, depending on those spaces um, of course we're going to do that yes So if you could cast the SCP 5K movie, who would you pick? Who would you uh, cast? Oh, man. Mm. Well, that's hard because Pee Wee Herman passed away. <laughs> who would Pee Wee Herman play? <laughs> well, he's, he's, he's got to play the UIU leader, right? He's got the chops for it, I think. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, that that, that 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 was out of left field, but uh, I I love that. <laughs> Got some great uh, casting suggestions of Nick Offerman to play uh, play Trey Bishop. Perfect. I think he I think he did play uh, a game developer in a movie recently. Actually. Oh right, I think that it was about Valorant. Like an esports e scene. Oh, was there another one? I was thinking of uh, something else. It was like a psychological horror movie. Um, oh. Oh, never mind. I think the one I was talking about had Mark Wahlberg in it.
was it the other guys? No. Shoot. Devs. It was just called Devs. I can't believe I didn't think of it. It was a TV series that came out in 2020. They did a pretty good job in it. Chris Pratt is crow. <laughs> hey, it's me, bye. It's a me, crow. <laughs> I'm surprised nobody suggested Vin Diesel or uh, The Rock. Oh damn! Well, this is a trick question. Like they're trying to they're trying to fool us into giving them more information than we should. Because if we start telling them who we're going to cast for the movie, we'll have to start telling them what characters are going to be in the game from beginning to end before we're supposed to. I'm not following. What? The Rock is going to be in the game? <laughs> oh, damn. Jack Black is SCP-173. <laughs> no, tentatively, there is no uh, announcement uh, for a movie. <laughs> this is just fan speculation. Um, who knows, but do not take this as anything official. No movie so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you ever hear, uh, you know, uh, Bowman talk, oh, my God, he he's, he wants SCP, you know, uh, to take over the planet. The movie will arrive as soon as the theme park will, uh, opens. Yeah. And then we'll have video game adaptation of the movie adaptation of the original game. <laughs> We're going to have 19 books. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. Have you ever gone to the bookstore and seen, like, you know, multiple Halo novels on the shelves? Uh, you know, it's a fervent genre for people looking to expand the lore. Mm. I had the incredible embarrassment of uh, buying a Gears of War book because I really wanted to know what the secret... Um, they were hiding in the third game was. IRL SCP facility park would be amazing. Yes, it would. Mm. Yes, it would. What is the story of this it's butt really ghost? I the butt ghost. Yeah, what, what is the butt ghost? <laughs> don't, don't... Don't talk to him. He's <laughs> feeling him. No. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. The butt ghost is not a thing. Can we? Can we give Sterling permission to speak just long enough to tell us about the butt ghost? Uh, let me see what I can do. been he's been uh bringing up this butt ghost thing all right sterling uh scp 789-j is a ghost that is a face it lives in a toilet and it talks to you while you poop Huh. Then, when you poop, it goes, no, stop, ah, and then stops because there's poop in its mouth. SCP-789-J travels around in butts, and you can only get rid of it by wiping. That is the moral of the story. Sometimes it kills other butts and makes them butt ghosts, too. But it is always lonely because it is a butt ghost. Uh, I'll tell you what. Compromise. I'll put the butt ghost in the game, but its face is going to be your face. No, that's a good twist. Nice. Oh, fuck. Now you heard it there first. Mm. Well, I'm obligated now. It's, it sounds uh, as suitable as the... Forward or backward? It sounds just like... You use a bidet. It, it almost sounds like the infamous SCP that's Tupac's ghost who solves his own murder made by infamous screenwriter Max Landis that the, <laughs> all the SCP writers absolutely despise. <laughs> Tupac. <laughs> he solves his own murder. <laughs> that is Kino. <laughs> we have 
have a uh, this Sterling's one of our, our 3D artists. He's really talented, despite the shit that we give him here on the stream. Um, his face that he's posted in the chat there, we have hidden it in so many places in the game. <laughs> it's in a lot of concept art as well. We've used it everywhere. I have a brush. I made a brush for Photoshop out of his face, actually. Oh yeah, we've the, the cat's out of the bag. Sterling is actually a dev on the project. See, <laughs> there is so much intrigue in this these streams. You don't know who's a dev, who's not, who's a secret developer, who will pop pop in. Oh my God, a, revelations! No, so much drama. <laughs> yeah, we have we have decoys as well. We have people that that masquerade on payroll as devs, but they're not really devs. It's five levels of subterfuge, Eyes. plot twists that Hideo Kojima could not even manage. Yeah, 3D chess. Like, you can't figure out if we're lying or not unless you plug the controller into the other slot. <laughs> That's deep. Now you just need to add a SCP uh, Psycho Mantis <laughs> boss fight. <laughs> I only just, I only just know. Psycho Mantis boss fight, that'd be great. Um, wait a minute. Yes. Secret Agent Pancake asks, is there a backstory behind that face? Although we kind of covered it. Uh, that is one of the developers who has infiltrated uh, Area 12. Sterling made the mistake of sharing a, an embarrassing bad photo that someone took at the right time when he was sneezing or something. I'm not sure. And and I kept it, and I've used it everywhere. That's it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> he has. He looks great. He's, he doesn't actually look like that. <laughs> The butt ghost last night. Ooh, interesting question here. Uh, are there any plans to tell many parallel stories along with our main journey into Area 12? Nothing major, but like seeing a scientist quickly collecting files, then later seeing him being chased by Peanut as the lights flicker. Stuff like that would explain why Peanut would not be on us 24-7, as there would be other targets. Well, that was a lot. Okay, hang on. That was from K-Extreme, right? Yep. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read that again, just because it was a lot. Are there plans to tell many parallel stories alongside me journey to Area 12? Um, yes, yes. In fact, among those, I, I guess you could call them side quests or side objectives, side missions, whatever you want, whatever you want. Um, those will exist, and it is very important to me that Dave continues to be among that. Uh, I've, I have so many wonderful feelings for Dave, and, you know, I there is a religion for Dave. Um, so, Dave be with you, and uh, good things come to those who wait. Here's an interesting question from Secret Agent Pancake. Half-Life style scripted sequences like that would be sick. Not going to lie. Uh, are there plans for like Half-Life scripted events or do we kind of like looking for more diegetic kind of organic gameplay? Um, we're trying to use as much diegetic gameplay type stuff as possible, but there will be some Half-Life-esque um, things that are sequenced that will occur around you in the game as well. 
<laughs> well, this is a, a good, interesting animation question. Um, have either of you, Samir or Anders, uh, done uh, like uh, you know uh, animating scripted sequences and like environmental damage or whatnot? And if so, how does that compare to like what the character animation you're doing now? Is it more difficult, more fun, less fun, more tedious? Um, I honestly haven't done that yet, and I imagine it would be a very different thing, like almost like working on a movie or something, where, or I imagine it being kind of in between, because you have, when you have very scripted sequences, you typically just make the whole thing, you have multiple actors, uh, like interacting and stuff, while well, when you're making stuff for a game, well, in that case, you're just going to have a lot of different things happening, bugs all around you, right? Like you have to make stuff line up and hopefully everyone is in the right place at the right time. Uh, so yeah, I guess it's going to be at least cleaner way of working than working on like specifically game stuff. So it would be cool to try. Because they well aren't because I know that they're like some of the most com uh, complex things to animate. Just because like, you know, the, the Call of Duty games are all filled with them, and they take like you know two thousand people three years to churn one of those out. Um, so it definitely seems like one of the most uh, interesting and difficult things to animate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, don't they take like two thousand people? Like all the Call of Duty games have like you, you know when you watch the end credits for one of those, they've got like. A ridiculous number of people. Yeah. I, well, I mean, when you're talking strictly about, like, motion capture, typically if you want to have all of the stuff happening in that scene, you would probably just play out the scene in a big room with a lot of equipment, a lot of actors. Um, so, yeah. Like, then it would basically, like, recording a movie, more or less, without, you know, of course, the, the set. It's more just getting all of the motion, and then you try to keep that as best as possible i think so carpus brings another interesting question when the human ai eventually gets reworked to hopefully use cover for cover uh, you can't pierce through could you destroy the cover uh with enough bullets or more destructible environment or would this be a concernable would this be a concern on system resources for you know the home computers? Uh, definitely something that we would all love to have, but would probably unless we can find a way to to find some workaround, do some some technical magic wizardry. Um, because of the nature of it being a, a networking like multiplayer game, it is kind of heavy on resources um, and it presents a lot of opportunities for bugs and issues because uh, what we have to deal with a lot of times is um, there's there's basically two versions of the game that are happening on, on two different screens simultaneously when two people are playing together um, one person's getting a first person view and the other person's getting a third person view and uh, those things everything that happens if you affect something like if you have a physics thing like uh, something falls from the ceiling and is dangling if you shoot at it and it swings Making sure that that swings at the exact same time without um, delay or whatever in the same way, in the same direction for the other player that's viewing the game in third person, um, you run into issues where it doesn't match up and it can create a lot of confusion and frustration. Um, and so it's a, it's a little trickier. It's not as simple as just let's make things destructible. Um, we, we run into the, a similar issue with uh, the cost of having uh, dynamic lights versus static lights where you can shoot them out, which is a shame because I love, like, my default thing to do is, like, oh, I'm going to shoot all the lights and hide in the dark and then take you out one at a time. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's something we would love to have, but it will really depend on, on what we're able to achieve, but still maintain um, a good enough frame rate for, for players across the board with the, the specs that we've sort of um, trying to build the game out for. Will there be more jump scares, like D-class attached to a rope falling from the balcony? 
And w- what is your um, philosophy towards animating jump scares? And uh, what do you guys think about jump scares? Are they good, bad, cheap gameplay tactic, or fun, spooky uh, horror house? I'm actually curious to see what you guys think before I say anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, personally, it's an interesting uh, mechanic for sure. And uh, there's nothing that could replace that. But, like, it's an uh, effective thing. Uh, no matter what you think of it, it's like, yeah, it does work. And it gives you that kind of immediate kind of scare thing. So, yeah, maybe. Depend- it depends on how it's done. I found it pretty interesting in, in uh, Alan Awake 2. Uh, from the reviews that people don't really like the jump scares. I think they've done it in a way where it's very cheap because it's a PNG that screams at you. But it keeps you tense. And what happens, you know, the the events that happen, it also almost intensifies the emotions you would receive. So it, it, it really depends on how it's done. If it's done too often at a at a un at a time that it wouldn't call for, it, it would get annoying very fast rather than scary. I think you nailed it on the head right there with the comparison to a loud sound and a, a flat image that pops up in the screen that you can't avoid. That's meant to startle you because it's an abrupt loud thing that's just taking up your vision. I think that is what I would consider a cheap jump scare. People tend to generally say that jump scares are cheap, uh, lazy ways of, of creating scares in a game, but I think it really depends on how you tackle it. Uh, an yes. example of a difference w- between that that would be considered cheap and something that's more effective and clever is, is something as simple as walking down a hallway, you've got your gun raised and you've your flashlight's on, and you're, the, the end of the hallway is way <laughs> down far, um, but it, it doesn't have to be close. You could be halfway down the hallway and you've got a good 20 feet to get to that that tee off where the hallway splits off two different directions but as you're walking down it suddenly you see someone just run past you know right past that opening mm-hmm. there's no loud sound there's no scream but just seeing someone just pass there and it doesn't look right that's that's something that catches you off guard and, and startles you and it feels unsettling and it's technically it's technically a jump scare um but it's not cheap um and like it, a, a cheap thing is always going to be just trying to force somebody to react because they don't have a choice because something's loud or abrupt versus actually like getting under someone's skin psychologically and making them feel apprehensive because with that kind of jump jump scare where you see something run past the end of a hallway then you're now thinking there's someone down there and now you're now you're now you're conditioned to be afraid of moving forward or at least be nervous about it because you're anticipating that there's going to be someone there and they're likely not going to be friendly. And that's that's true horror. Um, so we want to do things like that. Um, so yes, we want to have jump scares. Yes, we like them, but there's there's a variety to them and there's a cadence to having um, that variety make sure that there's like uh, intensity, low intensity, suspense and build up, uh, a quiet calm and then intensity, and then, you know, just keep mixing it up that way so that you never get numb to it, or it become it doesn't become something that's just annoying or predictable. A roller coaster of emotions. Roller coaster of blood. Do you add a banana peel next to the waterway on the first mission so that when you walk on it, it checks you into your death? I would love to, but I probably won't. Secret Agent Pancakes asks, what's your opinion on SCB uh, containment breach as a whole being one of the most popular things to ever crawl out of SCP? Uh, I believe that's the uh, video game, uh, the other video game, or as I like to call it, the Distinguished Competition. Mm, No such thing as competition here. Um, Every... Every project that is a studio, whether it's a bigger one or an indie team or just a solo dev, if they're working on an SCP project, it's just bringing more attention in a positive way to growing that community that exists and that the, the, the whole world of SCP. Um, I think as long as they're not mean and toxic to people in the community, it's always going to be a positive thing. Uh, so, so not competition. Uh, so that being said, myself personally, I won't speak for Caden and Anders, 
I love it. I like any project that's SCP, and I'm always interested in going and looking at it and checking it out. Um, there's no such thing as a as uh, another project being like a, an intimidating thing or something that I feel like, oh, you're you're, you're you know you're encroaching on my turf, buddy. It's not like that at all. Um, I encourage anybody and everybody to to make their own projects. That's the whole point. Yeah, I agree. Um, it really goes into the same kind of ballpark as looking at other tactical shooters, where uh, not only are we friends with many of the other developers and we're working on the same projects across different studios and it's like a whole synergy going on there uh, because of the whole indie scene, it's also like a whole breeding ground for new ideas. Like if someone gets a really good idea for their game, it typically ends up being in other games and we have taken a lot of ideas from like in search of Sandstorm, Escape from Tark, we're like, yeah, there's a lot of good ideas there and you just kind of at some point realize that we're not really inventing the wheel here. We're just like taking it one step further in a style that we like. And when it comes to other SAPs, SAP games as well, it's like, well, it depends if it's a tactical shooter or is it more like a puzzle game or um, like it, it all depends on like what they're trying to do. And in every aspect, like Dre says, it's like, yeah, it's awesome. Like that means one more game I can play. I like that. And it's also another reason to kind of uh you know take a look at that game and and like learn from them and get yeah it, it's a really nice like synergy like i said mm -hmm. there's some great projects out there and they all have something different to bring to the table because i mean it's the same thing with like in a, in our in our own development team everyone has their own opinion of what they think is good um, and there has to be people dedicated to choosing which direction we're going to stick with to make it cohesive otherwise we're all over the place so from of course from studio to studio you're going to get a variety of different kinds of uh, products of those those projects that they envision um, which is is great because um, they're all different kinds of games and they all, all offer something different um, I can think of a few off the top of my head that are great to check out like SCP uh, Secret Labs, Secret Files, the Fragmented Minds Project, uh, all these things have really cool and interesting approaches that are very unique to their perspective on how they want to tell a story and give a player a different kind of experience. So I'm, I'm excited about them all. I've, 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 I've checked out most of them, and I encourage you to as well. My apologies for my. Uh, for, oh, that, that was a wonderfully composed answer. I was just trying to like back in the old days of the 1960s, uh, Marvel would call uh, DC the distinguished competition. So it was, it was kind of like a fun, playful thing. <laughs> So will you guys be adding different difficulties in the future? For example, less ammo spawns or more enemies? Uh, yes. Um, difficulty settings are definitely something we want to have. Um, it's been harder to put that in earlier because we've been trying to finalize the mechanics and systems that we need in the game that aren't all completed yet. Um, once those are all in, it'll be much easier for us to be able to affect those things and have different toggles for those settings and as well as like our ammo which <clears throat> we're getting closer to being able to do those things that's why we've been putting in the armory and we're, we're finishing up things like first aid kits that are on walls and uh, ammo lockers that are spread out in other places um, so there's that and then the other thing was um, it wasn't just difficulty it was less ammo spawns or more enemies yes um, Balancing ammo and balancing enemies and enemy types depending on the areas is, is something that we're working on pretty actively Here's the real issue. When you're animating uh, Captain Crunch in the game, when you put my bird in, uh, SCB uh, cute bird. Oh, that's the question for you, Craig. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Captain Crunch? 
Oh, oh yes, you, you've not seen the, the legend of Captain Crunch that has been spreading on movie nights and across the Discord? Oh, your bird. Yeah, that was a question from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was just a, it was a joke question. I forgot you named your bird Captain Crunch. I was like, so confused well, for a second. I was like, I was like the, the, the bird mascot for cereal was a toucan, not Captain Crunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, probably put them in there. We've got a couple of Easter eggs where we've got Dev's uh, pictures of Dev pets in the game. Because who doesn't want to have pictures of their dog or cat in a game where everyone dies? That's not what I was thinking. I was thinking of motion capture in full 4K uh, with as many polygons as you can add with 12,000 animations. Although uh, a picture would be really cute. Each and every feather moving independently. Captain Crunch demands avatar quality. I forgot to glue a lot of little teeny tiny ping pong balls all over your bird and uh, do some mocap. <laughs> I like it. Interesting challenge. Well, here's kind of an interesting question. Um, do you guys prefer like using motion motion capture or building your animations, um, you know, from scratch? What do you uh, generally prefer, or is it like a combination of the two? Yeah, both have uh, have very specific benefits because when you do motion capture, you end up with really like what do you even call those like details, like really good details. Like it's all the jitters, the stuff I'm trying to replicate as you speak in the animation here. All of the small like human errors, so to speak. That's what you capture, and then you try to get that and also something that feels and looks correct for the game uh so you have to do a bunch of cleanup on it and there's a bunch of work that goes into basically making what you record it into an actual animation then of course the other side would be the opposite where you start with basically nothing uh, some reference looking at okay i want to make this look realistic um yeah it, it works for certain things if we can do mocap that's generally better because you get more details for free um instead of having to make them and then uh, like i think you said isaac earlier with like how do you even mocap something like uh you know a creature with like four legs and two tails or something like that's not really viable so in those cases you don't really have the option um so yeah if you have the option that's nice if not then you end up with uh, having to do it the other way regardless Hey, uh, I see people saying things in the chat about donating money to us or, or, or whatever. I I appreciate it, and uh, it's really kind of you guys. But um, at the same time, I want to tell you, please please don't try to like worry about sending us your money or anything for a donation. Like uh, you guys have already done so much for us, and we've we've done a tremendous job uh, internally of trying to make the best use of that money uh, to to make the game that we're making. But if you do want to use money, uh, for anything to support us, I suggest doing something in a way that would actually benefit you as well. We do have a lot of merchandise. Buy yourself a shirt. Like if you want, then you can show off the project and how much you like it. And at least you're getting. I got my shirt today actually, Trey, and it's awesome. Like, uh, the quality is perfect. Yeah. The, the sweater was surprisingly, surprisingly soft. I yeah, it right? <laughs> Worth all what day. You, it's what like did that. you end up getting? Uh, the red, red uh, like, hoodie. Really, really smooth uh, fabric. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sterling, for uh, <laughs> I was like struggling to like find the link to the merch store, uh, but yeah, oh, that yeah. Is recently launched. Uh, check out that SCP Five K merch. Yeah, and we'll have some uh, we'll have some new merch coming very soon. Ooh, I, I can't wait for you guys to see that. Um, uh, <laughs> it's really really cute, or it's really really cool and awesome and amazing and. Uh, yeah, so something I think you you guys are really gonna enjoy. Yeah. Well, you guys didn't know we had the XD Reaper. Did you not know we had the shirts and stuff? Oh, well, maybe we should be a bit more vocal about it. Then. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Alice, we have Our bad. merch. Yeah. 
these pennant and announcements. Maybe we will. Yeah, maybe we will. Yeah, I've definitely been pushing the merch on socials, but I always try and find that balance of not being too obnoxious because, you know, you don't want to be Logan Paul, but at the same point, you know, you want to know people that exists. But it, <laughs> they are linked. If you go to the YouTube channel, uh, it is uh, now linked to the YouTube channel, so you can see, like, all the merch there. Uh, it is there. Yeah. These are actually really nice. They're... Um... Bella Canvas, I don't know if anyone here knows anything about shirt products, but like Bella Canvas is a really nice, smooth, soft shirt. It's light, uh, very comfortable. But um, yeah, well, we've been trying to, um, we've been trying not to bombard people with tons of announcements and pings on Discord unless it had to do with an, a game update or something. So sorry we didn't get this out to you guys a little bit more. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, definitely a balance. Well, I think uh, now we've uh, kind of like hit the right balance of having like like community events tab. So people who want to be paying for these th events, you know, know about it. But we're not like spamming the server uh, every time for like, you know, questionnaires and whatnot. Oh, a separate channel just for merch announcements. That's not a bad idea. Hmm. That's not a bad idea. Just make it to where nobody can post in there. It'll be just like an announcements channel, but we can post an image for each new thing that we've got and with a link to it or something. That'd be cool. We could do that. Yeah, it's, it's, it sounds like a great compromise. Okay. Well, um, I don't know how much longer the stream is planned for, but I've actually got to go. But thanks for letting me kind of uh, crash the party a little bit. And... It was really fun. I appreciate all the questions and Anders uh, and Caden and Isaac, Sterling, the other devs over here, Hunter, everyone. And of course, the community members. You guys are great. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing your reactions to the news that is coming out very soon about the update. You're going to love it. Have a good one. See you. Thank you for yeah, being here. Thank you for your um, showing up. I think we can absolutely start uh, rounding off very soon. Like the animation here is, uh, it's it's getting there. It's probably about 70, 80 percent done. Uh, um, the next step now would actually to be a break. Like I need to rest my eyes, get a fresh perspective, um, then do another pass. Then I would do head animation, um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I'll also of course post um, the finalized render um, somewhere. We'll find a way, uh, Isaac. Like, maybe we'll make an announcement or something. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. I definitely, you know, I I'm as willing to host these as long as any time you guys are available. So, you know, definitely uh, love to have you back and do this again. Uh, this was uh, fantastic. And, uh, yeah, uh, I this was uh, an absolute pleasure. Yeah, likewise, guys. And, uh, yeah, I really need to get sleep. It's like five hours until I'm going to be shooting a pistol. That's not good. <laughs> oh, man. Sleepy and shooting is not a good combo. Be careful. Don't pull a Dick Cheney. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dang. All right, guys. I'll uh, see you all later then, and thank you so much for showing up. It was very, very fun to uh, to do this. Um, and uh, that you stuck around for this long makes me very happy. Um, and yeah, like I said, we'll see if we can do this again. Uh, see if we can do some tweaks to it if necessary. And yeah, that's about it. I'd like to thank everyone as well for being here. And have a nice weekend. Have a great weekend. Um, it was a pleasure hosting this event. Uh, obviously, we're going to be doing more. Uh, the next major development is we will be having the uh, Josie environmental artist uh, come uh, to do a session to showcase that. Uh, that right now is uh, scheduled for this uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, there will also be a, a questionnaire going out because we want to host a game night uh, that everyone can play. Uh, so we're looking at like free to play battle royales. Don't worry, we, we will do a 5K game night. Um, I, I got some big plans for that. Um, but uh, I, I want to start something that's like easy to do and ultimately free to play. So everyone, as many people who want to play, can play. Um, that's the goal. Uh, and uh, 
look out for those announcements. And of course, uh, there will be another movie night soon. Um, so look out for that. Uh, I love accelerating it, and I'm so happy with how many people showed up tonight. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. And as always, uh, keep um, you're notified. Uh, go to the game announcements. Uh, make sure that you are notified. Um, uh, that you have commu the community announcements role, so that way you will always know uh, about upcoming events. All right, uh, Anders, you want to uh, end your uh, live preview and uh, give a final good night? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, mm -hmm. good night, everyone. And uh, again, thanks for showing up, and uh, we'll uh, see you again uh, hopefully very soon. Bye bye. Bye-bye. See you later.